All right, hey folks, so this is gonna be an interesting video. Now, I have been promising that I would make a phase two Warlock tank best and slot list for quite a while, and I was planning for it to be this like really big, highly edited video, but a few things have come up, and I've realized that I don't really have the time to sit down and make that super highly edited video, especially because I think this is fairly niche. However, the trade-off is, of course, that I think the people who really care about that information, who really want a however long this video is, you can look at the timer on it, the people who really care about this information will sit through a really long video going into all of the minuscule detail on why the best gear is the best gear. So, I'm going to do this without any editing. Literally, I refuse to touch the timeline. I don't know, unless like my house catches on fire and I have to pause the recording. I'm not going to drop this into Adobe Premiere. We're just going to send it as is. And that means that I'm going to have to flip between screens on the fly like this to show you all of the stuff that I have planned. So the main three things that we're going to look at is, of course, the in-game stuff, right? You know, my character, the gear that I have, the uh, 60 upgrades pages that I've created for the four different builds that I will be discussing within this video. Maybe I'll put timestamps, maybe I won't. Kind of depends. Honestly, if somebody in the comments wants to put down timestamps for when I discuss all the builds, I'll throw them in the description for everybody else. This is kind of like a, I want to get that information out to everybody, but I just, I need to do it with as little investment as possible. Anyways, with all of that being said, let's take a look first at the different builds. Now, keep in mind, this is going to be a very long video, so if it sounds like I'm kind of skimming here, understand that we will then return to all this stuff and go over it in more detail. But I want to make it clear the four different types of playstyles that I'm going to be discussing, because it doesn't exactly conform to one particular build. Now, for fire, this one, contradicting the thing I literally just said, does kind of conform to one particular build because the only way that you'll ever want to run this particular setup is with the destruction build that I talk about in my destruction tanking guide. This is specifically geared towards that. Pretty much no other lock build will want to run this. It is only good for that very niche situation. So, some universal stuff, right? You're going to see Neuralinked, Arcano Filament, Monocle, and Piston Pennant in every single build. But what you'll notice here, and we'll discuss this in a bit more detail, some variations, is that we have some of Fiery Wrath greens, less than I would use in Phase 1, because there are a lot of better off-piece slots. And the big one, and we'll discuss this in more detail later because it's a very confusing thing, is Hyperconductive Gold Wrap. This is a good option for a lot of other builds, I would say when it's off cooldown, this is BIS particularly for this particular build, Fire Destro. Now, we'll once again talk about this in more detail later, but I'm just going to keep moving. So Shadow, this is next. This is specifically for maximizing your damage basically on Mechanical Menagerie and just on Mechanical Menagerie. It's a little bit sketchy because obviously that fight hits really hard and this takes off a lot of tanky items to just focus on pure plus shadow spell damage and intellect whenever possible when it makes sense to do so. And there are some greedy choices here, like Dark Mismantle, Shadow Wrath. This is something that I actually have in game. I can look over here. Uh, yeah, I have this. And there's a lot of times where I just don't run this because I'm not really feeling comfortable in the healers in my run, and I'd rather run something like this which at least gives me more intellect, so I won't need to life tap as much. Or, of course, now that I finally have Synthetic Mantle, I got this today. If you have this, even though it's slightly less damage, it's really compelling, because this gives you way more survivability than Dark Mist Mantle. But we'll get to that. I have builds for that. This is purely for shadow damage. Same thing for the plus 14 shadow damage cloak. And most of the other stuff is identical, though... You'll notice we have Underworld Band here. I'll talk about the pros and cons of potentially getting this. Obviously, you're only going to want to run this in the pure shadow damage build. And Valdo Concoction Belt, this is something that most builds will be running as their pure Abyss item instead of Hyperconductive Gold Wrap. But it's really... It's tough to say. 
between this and some of the other options. I think that this is the best one, hands down, but there are some good belt options in this phase that, you know, we'll get into later. Now, moving on, well, that's pure damage for both Fire and Shadow, which of course are your two main schools. There's two other types of gear sets that I want to take a look at. Basically, gear sets that are not geared towards damage. Because, after all, we are a tank, and while I think that being able to do damage as a tank is a highly underrated skill by a lot of people, especially in the classic community, who really aren't as familiar with tank theory as retail players are, that sounds a little bit elitist, but I'm going to be honest, a lot of classic players have a very simple view of tanking. You stack on as much survivability as possible, you try to hold threat as best as you can, and if the DPS rip, it's their fault, they need to slow down, when no, you should be blasting as much as you can as long as your health stays above zero, and that allows your DPS to do more damage, which means the boss dies faster, the healers don't oom, etc. Uh, I've talked about this in a lot of videos, but I think that makes a lot of logical sense. That being said, I know that no matter what I say, there are going to be some people who want a survival-focused lock tank build, and I want to make sure I offer that to you. It's like, it, I, I'm trying to give you a nice, comfortable survivability build that doesn't make a bunch of really stupid gearing decisions that will completely fuck your threat. It's like, I know that if I don't talk about this, people are just going to say, well, I'm just going to look at what has the highest armor and slap that on, and you'll end up just playing like dog shit. So I'm going to at least give you what I think a really tanky lock build looks like, though I will give the disclaimer that I do not recommend playing this setup. I will talk a little bit more about why some of these pieces you're losing a lot to actually take them. And the main ones that we can see here is, of course, Coagulated Cloak. You're losing a ton of damage because this has no spell power on it. And sure, it has armor, it has stamina. It might seem way tankier than those other of Fiery Wrath Cloaks that we talked about, but there are some better options, which we'll talk about soon. And then Fighter Ace Gloves. This is, of course, the gloves from Nomergon that have really high armor, good stamina, and the only problem is they have really shit spell power. It's half the spell power of, if we look back at Shadow, of Dreamweave Gloves. This gives 18, and this gives only 9. So, not awesome. Now, this does provide more intellect, so that doesn't completely make up the difference. Spell power is kind of king here. I've talked about this before, but spell power is pretty much the only stat that matters for damage. Everything else is secondary. If two items have basically equal spell power, maybe minus or plus one, and then one has a gigantic serving of intellect, well, okay, yeah, the intellect probably, you know, tips the scales in that case, but no amount of intellect at this level, at least, is going to account for nine spell damage. So while these are really nice for survivability, you are losing a solid chunk of damage. Now... I'll talk about uh, this, because this is probably one of the more controversial things I'll put on here, but I'll get into that. Uh, Nog's Brilliant Gold Ring, there's two versions of this, of course. Uh, there is Nog's and Talvash's. I forget which one is Alliance and Horde, but they are both the same. Oh, I guess you can see Iron Forge. So this is the Alliance version. Nog's is the Horde version. They are completely identical. You can only get one of them. It's just different versions for different factions. And this is a really tanky ring, 70 armor, 16 stamina. You get a lot of survivability from this. This is probably one of the few items that I would say, if you really want to push your survivability, you can justify putting this on. Because while well, you are losing stuff like Lore Keeper's Ring, plus 9 uh, spell damage and healing, or, you know, the other options that we talked about, Underworld Band. And while that is like a decent amount of spell power, you're getting a ton of survivability from this. You're not really getting quite as much in the difference from Dreamweave compared to Fighter Ace, but 16 stamina, 70 armor is a lot. This thing is really nice. Now, trinkets are kind of a completely different discussion that we'll need to have later, but you may have noticed that pretty much all the trinkets in the previous builds were the same. Fire, I'm running this and Infernal Pact Essence. Shadow, Miniaturized Combustion and Infernal Pact Essence. And I'll give you a sneak peek at the final build we'll talk about. It's also running this trinket setup. So this is insane, and I'll discuss why later on, even though it might be obvious to a lot of people already. That being said, if you really want to take Wordle's Hardened Core, because it is a very strong trinket, 
you would not want to drop Infernal Pact Essence. This thing is actually bonkers. You would want to drop the other trinket, and you can maybe justify it. Though, once again, trinkets are an entirely separate discussion that we'll have later on. Now, finally, you'll notice that in this build, I'm only running two-piece. Well, all of the survivability, for the most part, is in your two-piece because of the plus 100 armor, and the hit is nice. Now... Obviously, getting the spell damage and healing proc is really good, which is why in pretty much every other build I recommend running it, but if you are trying to maximize survivability, then these Arathi Basin Boots give you a lot of stamina, a lot more armor than the tier set ones, so you could argue that for survivability purposes, this gives you more as like a direct upgrade over the boots than the proc would provide. Hard to say... We'll talk about the pros and cons in a bit more detail later, but finally, the last build, before we uh, do a bit more of a deep dive, you can see here, this is what I'm calling a balanced build, right? This is, in my opinion, the best build to run. It is my personal favorite, and I think it's important to look at both extremes, right? It's important to see how far can we push pure damage gearing with plus fire, plus shadow, and then how far can we push survivability? Stacking armor, stacking stamina, within reason. I think it is quite honestly idiotic to just only slap on armor and stamina and ignore spell power. You will just never be able to warlock tank that way successfully. So I did try to at least be a little bit conservative with my survival setup and only equip pieces that are truly very, 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 very strong. And... The balance setup goes a little bit further and tries to take a mix. Now, the big one here, which I think a lot of people are maybe surprised that I haven't discussed yet, is Blood Rot Cloak. This cape is nuts. And this is kind of one of the problems of only looking at pure damage or pure survival. Because I think Blood Rot Cloak you should just be running every single time. Because this is like the perfect item for a Warlock tank. It has the perfect distribution of damage and survivability. It is beautiful. It works perfectly for the way that we want to play. So I think you should always be running this, but there are, of course, times where I have taken the plus 14 cloak to try and cheese for parses, but it's like kind of do as I say, not as I do, right? I'm going to tell you how I think Warlock Tank should be played, and then I'm going to go off on my own and do some really dumb shit that I don't recommend you try to repeat, just because I am a massive parse whore, I've admitted it before, that's just how it is. But, Blood Rot Cloak, absolutely insane. We'll take a look at some of the other cloak options later, but I think this is pretty clearly your abyss, especially because it's super easy to get. It's two silver from the Stranglethorn PvP event. Everybody can get this basically the moment they hit 40. It is phenomenal. And we've seen Synthetic Mantle already. Obviously, this is running the tank tier pieces, I'm taking Lorekeeper's Ring here, as usual. This is just a really nice ring to have. And all, like, the other stuff. You know, it has Dreamweave, Vault of Concoction, and then the good trinkets. Okay. Now, that was 13 minutes. We did a brief overview on everything. But you may notice that there's this other tab I have up here. Sorry if I flashbanged you there. Um, so, we're only just getting started, because... All that I've discussed now is what your absolute best in slot is. And I hate best in slot lists that only tell you this is the best gear that you should get. And if you don't have this gear, you're dog shit, right? Obviously, it takes time to get there. Most of the gear I just showed you is from Nomergon. So the question that a lot of people I'm sure are going to have is, well, what do I run before I get into Nomergon? And as you can see here, I have pretty much gone, got in a very comprehensive list of every single piece of gear that you're going to want to run potentially for every single slot. Also for fun, I'm really not going to go into this uh, in detail, but if you do want to know the full list of consumables that I run, Lesser Arcane Elixir, that's the plus 14 spell power. Elixir of Fire Power gives you fire spell power. Mighty Troll's Blood, Healing Over Time, uh, actually, scratch this one. Forgot to update the sheet. That Elixir of Greater Intellect is actually not available yet. Uh, you can't get the alchemy skill for it. Greater Defense gives you armor. Greater Agility gives you agility. Fortitude gives you a tiny amount of additional stamina. I can actually show how much it is. 
It gives you, not actually stamina per se, but it gives you 120 flat health. This doesn't scale with anything else. So it's okay. I mean, 120 health is not nothing, but it's relatively minor compared to a lot of these other ones. Um, Lesser Wizard Oil is really, really, really good. That will give you a massive spell damage buff, and it doesn't fade on death, so you should always be using that no matter what. Scroll of Spirit 3 is only on here if you don't happen to have a priest, which pretty much always do. Technically, if you don't have a priest, you could also add the Scroll of Stamina for the stamina buff. Sometimes if I'm in pugs, I'll actually bring along scrolls just to buff my pet, especially the stamina one, because that buffs your demonic knowledge. Ideally, your priest should be buffing your pet with uh, Power Word Fort, and that will give you extra spell power from demonic knowledge, but a lot of times pug priests aren't super reliable about actually doing that. So you got to make do, you got to work with what you have and make sure that you're always coming prepared, right? Now, other stuff your classic suite of protection potions. There are actually good places in the raid to use all of these. Nature protection potion, I think, is the most universally applicable. There's multiple fights where you'll get decent value out of this. Fire protection potion, you don't really want to ever press this during a fight. The only reason to use it is if you pre-pot before thermoplug or menagerie, they both have decent chunks of fire damage. The actual potion itself has less value than all of the other similar shared cooldown abilities, which you can see on there. The other protection ones, or I think I have it on here, um, Lesser Stone Shield Potion also shares a cooldown. Uh, I don't think I have it on here. I, yeah, I didn't update my list, but where is it? Um, do I not? Magic Resistance Potion is uh, the one I'm thinking of. I guess I don't have it either on my bars or in my bags. But Magic Resistance Potion is another one that shares a cooldown with those. And that one's interesting too, because the shared cooldown for all of these potions is two minutes, but Magic Resistance Potion has a three minute duration. So you can actually press that as well before the cooldown. And the uh, Elemental Protection Potions, Fire, Frost, and Nature have a 60 minute duration. So you can press Nature, wait two minutes, press fire, wait two minutes, press frost, and then go into thermoplug with all three of those rolling. Not that you should, because you're not going to tell your group to like, hey, hold up six minutes while I press these potions. But a lot of times what I'll do is the moment Menagerie dies, I will just immediately knock back a frost protection potion because it takes us generally like a minute or two to get set up. Everybody has to like switch builds off Menagerie to get ready for thermoplug. By the time that we're actually pulling the boss, I have my potion cooldown off so I can press something like Magic Resistance Potion and have that going for three minutes. And that way I have the Magic Resistance for Phase 1 and 2 of Thermoplug. I have the Frost Protection Potion for Phase 2 of Thermoplug. And then I'll usually do like Stone Shield Potion later on. Uh, this one's really good. I use this on most bosses. I use this on Grubbis. Uh, Viscous Fallout, I usually don't press anything because it's just a really easy boss. Uh, Crowd Pummeler, I do this. Electrocutioner, I do this. Any boss that deals physical damage. Um, Menagerie, I usually pre-pot a Magic Resistance Potion and then use Stone Shield mid-fight right as Cluck is going out because that's when a lot of physical damage is about to hit. So these are all really, really good defensive options. Restorative Potion, this I can show... Uh, will remove magic curse, poison, or disease effects on you every 5 seconds for 30 seconds. This is another one of those that has the shared 2-minute cooldown. Uh, also, free action potion. That's another one of those. Free action potion... Ideally, you don't really have any cases in this raid where you should use it. The only situation where it's good is the Mechatorque... Not Mechatorque, Thermoplug Frost phase. But... There are a lot of other ways to clear your roots on Thermoplug. I would say it's more useful for Horde players because generally speaking on Alliance, if your raid has a single Paladin, they're going to be assigned to Freedom the Tank when they reach high Frost stacks, and then you don't really need to have a free action potion. Also, if you're like me and you're a Gnome, then you can Escape Artist it, so I don't even need a Freedom, and that can go on somebody else. So I do not need a free action potion whatsoever, but... It is nice to have in a pinch. I've been bringing along five of them to every single raid that I've done, and I haven't actually used one in like two weeks, 
but I still bring five because, hey, you never know. Actually, that's a lie. I did use two free action potions, but not for any fight. I used free action potions when I ran outside of the raid to summon myself back. I pre-potted uh, free action potion, ran through the Norm Normagon exit portal, walked out into a bunch of horde. They tried to CC me. It failed because I had it rolling, and then I immediately jumped back into the portal. And because I pre-potted free action potion, I did not lose my world buffs. And in the end, because the horde were camping the entrance, I just hearthed to Iron Forge and then did the logout skip to get back. Wasn't able to summon myself, but I actually, yeah, until I mentioned it, forgot about that. That was not really necessarily tanking usefulness, but, you know, it's a very flexible consumable. It's nice to have. And uh, I touched upon restorative potion and then just didn't finish talking about it. That is pretty much only used for phase three of Thermaplug, the nature phase, when you have the disease stacking on you. Once again, ideally, you should have people cleansing that off of you. The paladins or priests in your raid, I don't know what Horde has. I don't know if Shaman can remove it. Maybe they can. I'm sorry, I play Alliance. What can I say? I'm working on my Horde characters, but they're not 40 yet. But definitely priests can remove it. They should be cleansing your disease stacks. If you're like in a pug or your guildies are, I don't know, just like running around like chickens with their heads cut off and they're not dispelling you, then you will die if you reach really high nature protection or really high nature debuff stacks. So nature protection will not save you. If you're at like three or four stacks of the Thermoplug nature debuff and you take a tank rental, that thing is going to fucking blast you. At that point, it is better to just pop a restorative potion and cleanse off all those stacks because that will reduce the damage you're taking and it'll end up mitigating more damage than if you were to pop a protection potion. Ideally, like I said, you should never have to do that, but that's another one of those consumables where I've been bringing five with me every single raid. I have yet to actually be forced to use one of them, but it's always nice to have. I came very close to pressing it in my raid last night. I was at three stacks and I was like, Dispel, please! And I was about to press it, but then all my stack got, stacks words got cleansed. So, worked out in the end, but I almost used it for the first time. It is very nice to have, though. Now, for food, there's really two that you want to choose between. Tender Wolf Steak, that is plus 12 stamina, pretty good. Or Dragon Breath Chili. Dragon Breath Chili, um, have it over here. Well, this is Tender Wolf Steak, plus 12. I guess Dragon Breath Chili is not on my bars. But it causes you to belch fire in, on targets in front of you when you... I can't remember if it's when you take melee damage or deal melee damage. Either way, if you're tanking, it's going to be procking a decent amount. It won't do a ton of damage, but there really aren't any good damage food options. So if you don't think that you need the 12 stamina, so like kind of the early Nomergon bosses where it's not really important, just run Dragon Breath Chili. I would say Tender Wolf Steak is really helpful for the last two bosses, but beyond that, doesn't matter. Uh, healing and Mana Potion, straightforward. Uh, Oil of Immolation. I'll talk about these two, Oil of Immolation and Elixir of Coalesced Regret. Elixir of Coalesced Regret is one of the rune potions that you use to speak with the dead for like the Black Fathom Deep's uh, crafting stuff. I guess not rune, then. It's for the crafting thing. It gives you plus one to all stats. So it's basically half of a chest enchant. Is that worth spending however much money on? No, it's not. Is it technically speaking a consumable that you can use that theoretically gives you an increase to your damage and survivability? Yes. The one plus side is it does not expire on death. So you know that you're going to get the full two hour duration on it. So I guess that's, you know, silver linings. But I am ashamed to admit that I have definitely used these when I'm really trying to parse, not necessarily because I think it's going to help, but just because I kind of feel like it just adds to the effect, right? Where, like, if somebody clicks on me and they see, like, the gigantic list of potions under my character, seeing Coalesced Regret on there just kind of, like, it's, it's funny. So I use it anyway. And then Oil of Immolation is actually semi-impactful, but in a similar boat of basically don't use this at all unless you are going for rank 1 parses. It is a really good AoE damage consumable that does not share a cooldown with anything else and doesn't actually have a cooldown of its own. So you can effectively get a permanent immolation aura on yourself for the entirety of any boss fight 
except it's really fucking expensive. So buying a bunch of these to try and get rank one parses, it's going to break your bank. And you should never do this for any normal situation. Frankly, if you really, really want to push to help your guild clear faster and you want to use this on something, use it on Mechanical Menagerie because if it hits three targets consistently, it's doing a lot more damage than if it's just hitting one target. So that's something. And finally, uh, ending on one of my favorite consumables, something that I think a lot more people should be running and aren't, Rumsy Rum Black Label. This stacks with everything else. It does not share a buff or whatever with literally any other consumable. It is 15 free stamina. That is, what, 150 health? I think it's just 10. It's intellect that has the weird multiplier. So 150 health for free. Kind of comparable to Elixir of Fortitude, but, you know. It's pretty easy to get if you have fishing leveled up. And if you don't have fishing leveled up, what are you doing? Fishing is the best profession. Come on. Oh, fuck. As I say- Oh, I'm fucking stupid. Damn it. So, today is Wednesday. Or, well, today is actually Thursday because I'm recording this at 3 in the morning. Yesterday was Wednesday. And the Stranglethorn Fishing Extravaganza was up. Now, I haven't been able to do the Stranglethorn Fishing Extravaganza on Wednesday for the last, like, two weeks because I was raiding on Wednesdays. And I finally switched guilds to have times that work better for me. And one side effect is that I am now able to make it to the Stranglethorn Fishing Extravaganza on Wednesdays. So I was really excited last week when I decided to switch guilds that, oh, hey, I'll finally be able to do the Wednesday fishing event. And then I just completely forgot until literally right now. Fuck. I completely forgot that the fishing tournament was today. Well, I still need to get one more rare fish. I'll just get it Sunday. Easy. All right. Well, uh, minor detour just to explain how I'm really fucking stupid. Uh, normally, maybe I would just pause the recording, but you get to listen to that because I'm not editing it. It's a second channel video. Anyway, back to this stuff. So... Obviously, we have a lot to talk about here. There's a lot to dive into. Now, before I go over this, and, and I don't necessarily think I'm going to go through every single one of these, like, you don't need me to tell you that, oh, the Augural Shroud is roughly equal to White Mane Chapeau. A lot of this stuff, it's like, I, I'm going to put this in the... Oh, fuck. It's second channel. I actually, I can't put this in the description because... Since my channel is brand new, YouTube doesn't let me link to external websites. So if you want access to this document, just go to my Discord classic channel. It's going to be pinned, like, first thing. So I'll have it on here for anybody who wants it. Normally, I would link it in the description, but I literally am not allowed to. So, yeah. Uh, but this is mostly to be used as a reference for people who are trying to see roughly is this item that i got better than the other item and what you'll notice here is that i'm not differentiating between the four different builds this is kind of how i feel each particular item is in a vacuum in a sense you could view this as the rankings for the balance setup that i talked about before because i believe that this is the setup that you should be aspiring to build this all of this is in my opinion, your true best in slot, quote unquote. You can play super greedy for damage, but this is the stuff that is going to consistently, no matter what build you run, because none of this is plus shadow, none of this is plus fire, this is all plus generic spell damage and healing. So this is going to give you increased healing from your drained life, it's going to give you increased damage to your shadow stuff, increased damage to your fire damage stuff. If you get this gear... You can swap runes to your heart's content, and it will work for everything. It gives you good survivability, it gives you good damage, it is really nice. So, in a sense, this document is what I believe the balance setup should look like. In fact, I would hope that I did this correctly, where if you look at the top pick for every single one of these, it is the thing that I have on here. Actually, I just noticed, no. 
Um, I have a radiated boot still on rank one for boots. Let me change that. Um, yes. Yeah, there we go. So I'll talk about irradiated boots because that's an interesting discussion. And when I originally wrote this list, I stand by the fact that I think irradiated boots were the best possible option for boots. But the big thing that has changed is your three piece bonus. Previously, it was not very good. And now it is actually quite good. But looking over all this other stuff. Yep. You can see it's pretty much exactly what I recommend in that video. Or in that, not video, uh, best in slot list. So there's going to be some slight variations. Like, you, everything is on here, right? You can see, for instance, my... Uh, for fire damage, I have plus fire damage gloves. Because if you look at random suffixes, these are all the best. These all have uh, plus 20. The only reason I have Lunar on here is because this is the one that I actually have. If we look at my character, I have Lunar hand wraps. So I originally created this for myself, but I'm just showing you the pages that I've created. If you manage to get one of these, then it has slightly more armor. I would never recommend paying extra for one of these. Just get the one with plus 20. Only get the one with plus 20. Like, if you're getting plus 19, because it can roll slightly below, there's no point. At that point, just use Dreamweave Gloves. This is only worth getting if you are getting the full plus 20 uh, fire spell damage, because then it is, technically speaking, an upgrade over Dreamweave Gloves for the fire damage setup specifically. And I have this on here under gloves, but you'll notice it's like all the way down here under Bloodwoven Mitts. This should be generic green of Fiery Wrath, but I put specifically Bloodwoven, which is this technically the best. And you can kind of see what I think about it, right? I think that all of these other options, if we are building for like a really good actual lock tank setup, are better than just taking pure plus fire spell damage because that's another thing that a lot of people forget to consider when talking about fiery wrath or you know generic spell damage all this stuff is spell damage and healing so this is 18 spell damage and healing this is only spell damage right so you're getting effectively survivability and damage out of this you are not getting the same out of the fiery wrath stuff now with all of that covered we're going to dive a little bit more into specific slots for specific builds. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some overlap, right? Like every single build is running the helmet and the necklace. So I'm going to talk about what makes those best in slot for this build and all builds. And then in other slots that are more specific, like when we talk about this royal cape, we can discuss like, you know, the pros and cons, right? But first, I need to drink some coffee. Oh, I made a fresh mug of coffee before starting this. Like I said, it's three in the morning. If I don't have coffee, I am going to just collapse because after I record this and upload it, I still have like hours of additional testing and editing to do for a main channel video, which I hope to have done hopefully by tomorrow. But I mean, who knows? At the very least, since I'm not raiding this week, I have um, a lot more free time to work on this stuff. So... Honestly, the timing worked out really well for 10.2.6, aka Plunderstorm dropping, because I would not have the flexibility to play it as much as I have been if uh, it were not for me switching guilds and, you know, taking a week break in the interim. Anyways, let's start with the helmet. So, I think it would make logical sense to most people why this is just your best in slot. And it's not even close. If I look at the lock tank best in slot list here, I have this just a, a greater than sign. Uh, honestly, I'm going to change this because when I, what did I do? When I initially wrote this best in slot list, I was under the impression that this thing, electromagnetic magnetic hyperflux, whatever uh, we can see on here, if I go down, also keep in mind, this is not available. So you're going to see some stuff on 60 upgrades that does not actually exist. Because what you'll notice is that it requires engineering 245, which we cannot get. So 60 upgrades is assuming this is like regular classic where you can get 300 professions at, I forget what level it is. Is it level 40? I think it's actually much lower uh, where you can technically get to 300. 
and we can't. So next phase, I I think next phase maybe like this stuff will be good if we don't have this uh, off cooldown. But I mean, quite frankly, that's a discussion for another day. I plan on making a video about speculating phase three bis, and I'll put that on my second channel because. I don't want to put anything like that on my main channel because I will hopefully make an actual really detailed P3 BIS guide. Uh, quick note on that. One of the main reasons that my schedule for SOD has been very chaotic this phase is I had a really, really nasty cold right at the start of phase two that basically set me back like an entire week. So I reached max level really late. I was really late finding a guild, getting into Nomergon, because the guild that I was in for Phase 1 completely collapsed. So I'm already preparing a lot of my Phase 3 stuff in advance so that if, for whatever reason, I get sick again, if the universe really hates me, I can kind of play around it. But I basically just got like a life torpedo on the launch of Phase 2, and I've been playing catch-up ever since. So hopefully I'll actually have all my ducks in a row by then. I don't even know when phase three will be out probably over a month. Cause they usually give us a month's heads up, but either way, I will probably make a second channel speculation video, uh, before it actually comes out. So, you know, just a, a fun, what do we think will end up being run? Uh, but for now we have this thing, like I said, really good. And the other option, if we go down here, this is, is this the one yeah, I think this is the actual one that exists and not the um, the one. Yeah, so this is the original classic one. And this is the correct one. Hyperflux Reactivator. So this is not a bad helmet. It has a lot of intellect. It has no stamina, which this thing does have stamina. So it's not really great for survivability. One thing that I initially thought could be interesting is getting the nature barrier and then switching to a different helmet. And it's a little bit weird because the nature barrier actually doesn't go away after you switch helmets. However, it doesn't stack with fire shield or thorns. So it's kind of worthless. As for using it for the lightning damage effect, it really just doesn't do enough damage to really justify. Like, I just think that if you're going for AoE damage, a single tick of Hellfire with, like, intensity is just going to do more. And in that case, you would just want to have higher stamina because then you're able to pulse Hellfire for longer without worrying about dying. So really, this is not that great. And the only other comparable option is we have, where's a Spell Goggles Extreme? Oh, over here. So Spell Power Goggles Extreme, this is pretty much your best previous option. I do think it is worth noting that like, you should probably be playing Engineer Taylor. So that's kind of like the one tricky part of a lot of this stuff. You know, it's kind of a no brainer that this is really good, but I know a lot of other people don't really want to play Taylor and want to see like, what's your next best option. But the unfortunate thing is that your next best option is kind of these engineering goggles. So you're going to need professions regardless. Your pre bis is from engineering. Your bis is from tailoring. It's just really tricky to play a warlock tank. Or honestly, it's tricky to play anything in SOD without having crafted professions, which is kind of annoying if I'm being real. I really don't like this whole crafted gear meta. Especially that they forced it. Like, I don't hate the idea of crafters having powerful items that they can make, but I just really don't think that this should have a tailoring requirement. I don't see why. I think if you're able to craft a really powerful helmet and people have to bring you the items and you make it for them, that's still cool, right? Like, you're still going to make a ton of money off that. You still feel, like, really good that you can make the special crafting things. And then it allows more flexible options. And I guess Blizzard doesn't want everybody to just play engineering, but like, I don't know, it, it's classic. People are going to play whatever the hell they want. One of the downsides of everybody being forced to be um, crafting professions is I have a Digmaster 5000 on Horde side, and I've been trying to sell it for like two weeks, and I just can't because nobody has mining anymore. 
barely anybody actually plays their main with mining and is able to get the mining skill to use that item. Pretty much everybody does gathering on alts. Little mini rant there, but I don't love how this works, but it is just kind of the reality that you really want this. And I, since I think the main topic of discussion on Helmet is more, if I don't want to play Taylor, how big of a loss am I taking by not having this helmet? And the answer is a big one, like a really big one. This is really, 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 really good, and it's not even funny. Like, you may notice here, oh, well, there's some Fiery Wrath helmets that are ahead. No, not really. Because while this... First off, this is all spell damage, not just one particular school. So it's just good in general. The MP5 is not insane but that is nice it adds up you know you can consider that a little bit of survivability as i've always said because it means you don't have to life tap as much the stamina is really nice for survival there pretty much aren't any other good comparable tanky helmets this doesn't have any stamina the spell power goggles don't have stamina rakamars doesn't have stamina white main chapeau doesn't have stamina if we look at like what are my other ones yeah level 40 greens twilight's uh, invoker with the bonus which Obviously, you're not going to be running the bonus. This is only if you have leftover gear from Phase 1 Black Fathoms. So there's, like, no other good helmets. Not only are there just no other good alternatives for this crafted item, but it is so ludicrously powerful that we will probably not replace it in Phase 2. Or Phase 3, I mean. They would have to release yet another crafted helmet, which I don't think they'll do. And you can kind of see that they've been avoiding causing overlap, right? Like... They added these crafted helmets, and now the new tier sets don't have helm in them, and they also don't have gloves. So a lot of the crafted gloves from P1, people actually still use the uh, Void Touch Leather. Uh, one of the, you know, we kind of got screwed a little bit because we had extra planar spider silk, and now our tier slots are overlapping that. But unless Blizzard makes it so the Sunken Temple... Oh, did I give a spoiler? For the record, I don't have any inside knowledge, but I guess since I said it and I'm not going to be um, editing this video, there is data mining that leads people to believe that Sunken Temple will most likely be the Phase 3 raid, so if you didn't know that and you wanted to keep it a secret, sorry, whoops, but I think a lot of people already kind of figured that. Um, the only thing that I think some people may be surprised by is they kind of teased a Scarlet Crusade raid at BlizzCon with all those, like, little images and Karazhan crypts and stuff. And the predictions followed through for the most part, because the first raid that they teased was Nomergon, and that was the one after Black Fathom. But since it is most likely Scarlet Monast or Sunken Temple next, we're not getting the Scarlet raid. So maybe the Scarlet raid is the first one that we get at level 60, in addition to Molten Core. I don't really know what they're doing. They've said they have really big plans for 60 endgame, so curious to see that. But anyways, unless the Sunken Temple Phase 3, whatever you want to call it, a tier bonus overlaps with Helmet, I don't think there's any chance that we're going to drop this. At the very least, I think no matter what, we're going to use this for the 10-minute cooldown and then maybe swap it for a stat stick when it is on cooldown. But... There's also an argument to be made that, like, if you're going for Parse's next phase, you may still want to run this. And it all comes down to the on-use effect. So this thing is just actually nuts. 50 additional spell damage for 12 seconds. A lot of your damage is in your opener. And the biggest thing, absolute most important thing, is... Dots snapshot the damage while this is up. Now, you might say, well... Does that really matter, right? Because, you know, if the dot expires, you have to refresh it and this is down. But there's a little thing called Everlasting Affliction where when you press Corruption, it's basically present for the rest of the fight as long as you refresh it. So if you use your helmet and you put Corruption on all bosses of Mechanical Menagerie while your helmet is active, and then you continually refresh that initial corruption for the rest of the fight, that corruption will be boosted by plus 50 spell damage for the entire fight. So, you can maybe see why this is absolutely cracked. 
And also, you know, just having mana cost reduction for your opening burst is really good. Uh, you're also, in a lot of cases, going to be the PI recipient. Unless you have, like, a godlike fire mage in your group, I have been the designated PI recipient in my guilds, at least on pull. So, if we continue to get more burst cooldown stuff, having, like, a big upfront 50 damage burst along with PI, especially for dot builds, that's really good. And... I'm not going to spoil exactly what it is, but what I will say is that with the data mine warlock runes for P3, affliction playstyle dot related stonks, they're going up. I don't necessarily know if it's going to end up being the best build, but what I can say is that dots are getting a shit ton of love in the data mined runes, and there is a very good chance that they overtake some of the other playstyles as the best way to play tank warlock at the very least it'll reinforce it as the best multi-target playstyle. that much i'm 100 sure on because on pretty much three or more targets dots are already the way to play because of everlasting affliction you need to hit like 10 or more targets for hellfire to actually be good and at that point you kind of need a paladin to make sure that you're not instantly getting interrupted because you know intensity is only going to help you so much when you have 10 targets hitting you this is, of course, all stuff that I will cover in more detail during my uh, Affliction versus Hellfire video, which I'm still working on. It'll be out later this week. As I've said, my schedule is a little bit chaotic. That's why I have to do this as a second channel video. But keep in mind that if that Affliction build continues to be dominant and we continue to get multi-target fights where Everlasting Affliction is absolutely nutty, then this helmet will just remain absolutely broken and effectively unreplaceable until we have stuff on the level of level 60 raid gear where we're just getting like 70 spell damage permanently so the cooldown is effectively worthless because you know why would you get temporary uh increase when you could just like have it permanently until we're effectively getting the permanent value of this set or of this on use effect or close to it this is going to remain our best in slot so you can maybe understand why it is ludicrously overpowered right now and should be a major priority for you to get as soon as you possibly can now moving on to necklace something interesting you may notice right out of the bat is that according to 60 upgrades it's not even our bis uh the piston pennants because the weighting on here for crits is really high now uh, i think that it's overweighting crits this obviously is not worth taking just because you're losing literally everything else, but this is not going to give you more damage overall. Do not get baited by this. 1% chance to crit is not better than consistent 9 magic uh, and healing effects, so just, yeah, don't get baited by that. As for the other options, the main two... Uh, actually, I forgot the Curiosity Pendant is not terrible, uh, that's the new uh, supply crate heirloom, effectively, item. This is okay, but it really shouldn't be used. By the time that you reach Revered with the heirloom crates, you can very easily get the other two options. So Goat Shard, Talisman, this is, in my opinion, the much stronger pre bis option. You farm this from Azure the Sleepless in SM Graveyard. I have a video on how to efficiently farm this, so... If you have not gotten your Ghost Shard Talisman, you really should go and get it. It's really not hard to farm. If you use the respawn method that I have showcased in that video, which that one I might be able to link in the description. I think I can link to other videos within YouTube. I just can't link outside of YouTube as like a fresh account. So this one is really good. Now, Jagged Bone Necklace gives you a tiny bit of intellect and armor, and it gives you plus six spell damage and healing. This gives you only plus 5 spell damage and healing, but it gives you 9 stamina. So both of these are very powerful options. And if you already have Jagged Bone Necklace, you could probably just continue running with this until you get the uh, Thermoplug, you know, engineering notes and turn it in to get the Piston Pennant. But I would say that if you have the time, Ghost Shirt Talisman is better because 21 armor... I think a lot of people think that it's really good because, wow, it's a necklace with armor and we don't have anything else like that. But this is really not a lot. 21, uh, what's the multiplier on Metamorphosis? 
armor increased by 500%. So this is... I'm probably going to butcher the math. I want to say it's like, what, 105 armor in total? Just from the necklace? Which, it's not terrible, don't get me wrong. 105 armor is not nothing. But if we're comparing which one is better from a survivability standpoint, 9 stamina is much better to have than 105 additional armor in meta. And obviously this one has one more spell damage, which is okay, but... You know, between one spell damage, it's pretty trivial. Both of these, in my opinion, are basically identical, but personally, I would prefer the added stamina. Just gives you a bit more of a safety net. And really, all the other necklaces kind of suck. If I look at what I have on here, Black Shroud Choker. Yeah, that's another one. Um, that's also from BFD. Only use that if you were playing a shadow damage setup, which realistically is only on Mechanical Menagerie. So... I guess you can get away with that if I search Black Shroud Choker. Um, uh, yeah, it does have a decent amount of stamina and shadow resistance, so it's not bad. I would say that for Menagerie in particular, this is probably your best option, but you can also just go with Jagged Bone. It doesn't really matter. That's uh, Necklaces Covered. Now, for shoulders, uh, I think this stuff, of course, that entire discussion applies to pretty much all of the builds. I'm not really going to discuss these slots further. Um, yeah, I, I could bounce around between stuff that's specific to the fire setup. I'm honestly just going to go slot by slot, and we're going to talk about specific builds and flip between them when necessary. So, it's no secret that Synthetic Mantle is the absolute best pair of shoulders that you can get as a warlock, in fact, since we're going to be bouncing around anyway, I'm actually just going to stay on the balance setup and only move between the builds when necessary. So for shoulders, this one is just actually crazy. It's really good. It gives you basically anything that you would want as a lock tank in your shoulder slot. It's kind of like what I said earlier about Blood Rock Cloak, but even better because it has bonus armor. So we get armor, we get stamina, we get intellect, and we get spell damage. That is the Bis Warlock Tank stat line. You know, there's some other stuff that we want that's like kind of nice, like here, MP5 on top of that is nice, but if I could trade, for instance, the MP5 on this ring for additional stamina, same with like the resistances, I think that it would be stronger for it, which is one of the reasons why this is so good, because intellect on t or stamina on top of that, and then, you know, the MP5 instead of int is fine. Um, but yeah, basically that is the kind of stat line that you want to see on your pieces, especially for this type of balance setup. The only thing that we need to talk about is, of course, the Shadow Wrath shoulders. So you're losing a lot of survivability by running this. I don't necessarily know if the trade-off is worth it. And one of the bigger issues in regards to the Shadow Damage setup is that right now, the only fight where you're going to be running Shadow Damage stuff is on Mechanical Menagerie. And honestly, Mechanical Menagerie is the most difficult fight in the raid to do as a tank, survivability-wise. That fight fucks. It absolutely rips you a new asshole. Thermoplug hits hard, but the thing about Thermoplug is that all of his damage is really predictable. So, if your healers are paying attention, you should never actually struggle in Thermoplug, because if you have enough health to survive a slam into an auto-attack, then the only way that you die is that your healers are literally asleep. And if your healers are asleep, you're going to die to Thermoplug no matter what build you're running, because, you know, a single penance will top you up. That is just a healer skill issue if you die there. But Menagerie, there is a lot of really, really difficult burst damage for the healers to deal with, where if you are playing a squishy setup, you will just get shredded, and the healers cannot react. I am guilty of this, not necessarily because I was playing you know, a greedy setup. But there have been times where I let the dragon overheat all three bosses and I'm like, oh, I'm fine. And then I just get like 100 owed in a few seconds without even pressing a health zone because I just didn't react in time. I'm like, oh my God, where did my health go? Uh, now, like, of course, th that was earlier, right? Now that I know what to expect, I always let the healers know I'm like, overheat's coming out, big damage on tanks, and they know to focus me. I also make sure the moment I see overheat, I'm like, I'm ready 
finger on the trigger with my health stone. If my health starts to like spike down, bam, health stone. It's not guaranteed to keep you alive, but stuff like that you need to know because frankly, overheat is even scarier than cluck in a lot of cases because we have a lot of armor. We're pretty good at dealing with auto attacks, but fire damage, if we don't have like good resistances, that will just fucking shred right through our armor. So really, really, really spooky. Which means that that added stamina on Synthetic Mantle for the only fight where the shadow damage really matters is really, really important. So keep in mind that four shoulders, right? We have Synthetic Mantle, the shadow damage one, and then Inquisitor's Shawl. So Inquisitor's Shawl, Invoker's Mantle, Magician's Mantle, that's the stuff that I want to talk about, so I'm going to take off that. Uh, Inquisitor's Shawl, this is from Scarlet Monastery, really easy to get. This is pretty much your pre-raid bis. This has decent armor, plus eight intellect, no stamina, notably, and plus nine to damage and healing. Now, because this has no stamina, and it's not really giving you any direct survivability increase, if all you have is Inquisitor Shawl and you have not yet looted Synthetic Mantle, I would say you can justify using the plus 20 shadow damage piece. Because at that point, you're not really getting any notable survivability increase by running Inquisitor Shawl. You're technically speaking getting a slight increase to your healing, but I mean, that's really not going to save you to overheat damage spikes. So I think in that case, this is a bit easier to justify. But once you have Synthetic Mantle, this is just much tankier and provides close to the same amount of damage. I would say it is the no-brainer pick, even for a focused shadow damage setup. And it is very obviously, as we've already discussed, your best well-rounded, balanced, so to speak, uh, shoulder slot item. And as for some other pieces we can see on here, really there's not a lot. Invoker's Mantle, Crimson Silk, Magician's Mantle. Uh, really, you should never be running Magician's Mantle. This is something where Invoker's Mantle, the crafted item, is just better. And this is pretty cheap on the auction house. You can get this basically for free at level 25. So the only thing that's slightly better is Crimson Silk Shoulders from Tailoring. But I don't know what the materials on this are, but I believe they're at least significantly more expensive than Invoker's Mantle. So realistically, just don't even get this. Get this at level 25. Then when you're leveling up and doing Scarlet Monastery, get this. And then hopefully you get Synthetic Mantle. If you're like me, and I, I literally only just got it today. Oh, I got disconnected. Shit. Um, Alright, that's unfortunate. But if you're like me, and you literally just looted Synthetic Mantle today, uh, right, like, you know, on my... I, I don't, this is like my 12th Nomergon? I don't even know how many. I've done a lot of Nomergon. Uh, after, like, my 5th Nomergon, I bought the 20 Shadow Damage Shoulders on the Auction House because... It was cheap, it was like 15 gold, which considering how good it is and how hard it is to get a roll that rare, 15 gold is kind of a steal. You can sell those things for like 30 to 50 if you uh, are patient enough. So if you have the gold and you really want to push your damage, it is an option, but you can also just wait for Synthetic Mantle because it is just better. Now, capes. For this one. Uh, I've said before that I think Blood Rock Cloak is without a doubt, the best option. This gives you 11 spell damage and healing, and the difference is not really that major between this and the plus 14 cloaks. So, I don't know. It's hard to say, because on one hand, yeah, these give more damage, but like, it really, are you going to sacrifice all that intellect, all that stamina, for three additional damage? I don't know. I think I'm less inclined once again to do this for the Shadow Damage Cloak. So this build, you know, that you see, right? This is a really greedy setup. I actually, I completely forgot to even discuss Emerald Crystal. I'll talk about that later at this point since I forgot to mention it in the overview. But Umbral Crystal is, is a fine option for Shadow Damage. But these greens that offer you absolutely no survivability whatsoever... They are really hard to justify in this setup currently where Menagerie is the only situation in which you're using it. Because the thing about the fire damage setup is that you're playing this on bosses like Grubbus, uh, Viscous Fallout, Crowd Pumbler, Electrocutioner, pretty much those four. And on those fights, there's really not that much tank damage going out. A lot of the scary stuff is completely avoidable, 
you should never, ever be in danger of dying unless Grubbis gets enraged. He's actually the scariest of them. But even then, like, I actually was tanking Grubbis down from 30% when he got enraged because he just got animation locked and the puddle just slowly drifted over him. And he's just sitting there. I'm literally trying to kite him and Grubbis just won't move. And the puddle slowly drifts across the room and lands on top of him. You know, it happens. And then I just popped a uh, lesser stone shield potion and tanked it, and it wasn't even really that scary. So, I don't know. It's just not really that bad to run the greedy fire stuff on those first four fights because there's just no damage coming out. You don't really need that added survivability. The same cannot be said, though, for that shadow damage stuff. So, you need to be a little bit more mindful of your survivability in those cases, and you can't really take stuff like this. I think. But the fire damage cape, yeah, you could probably get away with running it. As for other stuff, there are like options, like Ingenuity's cover drops from Menagerie. I have literally never seen this go to a player. Every single time this drops, it gets disenchanted because nobody wants it. Because Blood Rock Cloak, you can see here two silver blood coins from the Stranglethorn Veil vale event. You can get about five coins from every single Stranglethorn event if you are playing really, really safe. Maybe if you're playing super duper ultra safe, you're only going to get like two or three, but I would say five is easy and two is definitely achievable. The only way that you're not getting two silver blood coins in a single Stranglethorn event is if you're playing solo and you are just like chain dying to a group of five but if you're in a group of five and they have literally like any brain cells whatsoever you can get enough kills to get 200 blood it's not hard at all i'm not going to sit here and explain how the stranglethorn veil vale event works but i mean if for whatever reason you are having trouble with it go to kadamu the big troll just fight around him under the altar, and then the moment you manage to get kills, run to the altar, immediately claim your blood before you die and it expires, and like, it's just easy. It's really easy. All that to say, you should very easily be able to get Blood Rock Cloak, so... Like, I have some other options on here, but like, none of them are really worth discussing, because it's your pre bis and it is so easy to obtain, and it's better than anything that drops off Nomergon, so... Kind of just end the discussion. There's just really nothing that you need other than that. And like for lower level capes, I think when I was leveling up, I didn't even really get any good cape options. I was just using a plus 11 shadow damage cape that I had left over from phase one. So really not a lot of great level up options. Okay, so next is chess piece. But because chest, pants, and boots are all tied to the tier set, I'm going to discuss the tier set last and all of its associated slots last because they it's kind of impossible to talk about one without talking about the other because, like, we need to talk about, like, well, if you're only running two-piece, like, you know, what are your options for your other slots? And that's a much more difficult conversation to have, so I'm just going to move on to other stuff. So, I this is the Warsong Gulch epic bracers at exalted uh just to give you an idea i don't even have this um i never spent the time to farm warsong gulch rep in uh phase one of sod you can see literally here my current warsong gulch rep it's not even really close the way that i've been farming warsong gulch rep is just every single week you do the quest i haven't done it yet this week so i should be able to show it you go over here uh this thing repelling invaders you kill one of the random NPCs at the enemy faction's camp, it drops an insignia. You turn it into your faction's NPC. So Flore Moon Mommy or whatever the Horde one is, I forget. And you get 1k rep with your associated faction for that. Humans get the 10% bonus on top of that, which is kind of nice. They like skip a week effectively. But if you do that for, I guess, 21 weeks pretty much, then you'll be able to hit Exalted without having to set foot in Warsong Gulch. And everything up until the Revered to Exalted grind, you literally just AFK in Ashen Vale and collect Reputation. That was easier to do during Phase 1, and every single one of my alts, even like my level 10 alts, are now Revered with the Warsong Gulch faction, because whenever I wasn't doing anything during Phase 1, I was AFKing one of my alts in Ashen Vale. 
Now, obviously, hindsight's 2020, right? You can't do that as efficiently now, but you can still do it. It's just a little bit slower. So if you are not yet revered, then I would recommend doing that, especially because you get the other items too, right? But like, obviously right now, it's a little bit difficult to get those bracers. It, you know, on the Lion's side, Warsong Gulch is just basically unplayable for us right now. Like, I could sit there and spend 20, 30 hours grinding Warsong Gulch just to get plus two spell damage. But fuck that. I'm sorry. I just, I, I have better things to do with my life than grind Warsong Gulch forever. Now, if there wasn't an alternative, if I couldn't just slowly farm it with the weekly quest, I'd probably grind it just because I know that I need to do it eventually. But here's the thing. You do not need the Warsong Gulch Bracers to tank Nomergon. This is really not that important. But there's going to be better Bracers, effectively higher level versions of this, at level 50 and at level 60. And it's going to be really, really nice to have at level 60. So I want to make sure that I have it by then. And there are more than enough weeks in the year for me to just keep getting 1k rep every single week and slowly work my way towards that. So that's just what I'm going to do. Now, obviously, if you have these, they are your bis, and it's literally not even close. They are so far ahead of every other option. This kind of isn't accurate because it's only plus four. Keep in mind that the tracker on here on 60 upgrades only is for raw damage. This is a good bit better for just raw damage, and then it also has intellect and stamina, so it's just better for survivability as well. And it has more armor. These things are actually just broken. And unless they add some, like, ridiculously overpowered Bracer from Sunken Temple, this is probably still going to be your best in slot at level 50 when you get the level 50 version of it. So, still going to be worth farming. But, if you're like me and you don't have it, you can see that I have plus 14 Shadow Damage Bracers on. Now, I also have, and, and this is really, 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 really min maxi. Uh, I have plus 14 fire damage words, fire damage bracers. Now, you may notice that this is only one more than Phoenix Bindings, which is plus 13, and Phoenix Bindings is dirt cheap. So, if you are not stupid and have way too much gold to spend, then just get Phoenix Bindings for the fire damage build and use that. Well, this is technically speaking your second best behind the Warsong Gulch thing, obviously. If you are playing a fire damage setup. It is literally one spell damage and like a tiny amount of armor. The cost is not worth it. The reason why I have these is because every now and then people post them on the auction house for like one gold and I just snipe it because I am always watching the auction house or at least I am if my accounts don't get logged out because I'm too busy talking to continue monitoring. And yes, in, in case you haven't watched uh, any of my other videos where I just like, you know, record my screen and tap around. I have four different World of Warcraft accounts and I'm using all of them to play Sod. I have my, uh, these are all for sniper scopes. So, you know, I have them on the auction house and see here, sniper scope. Uh, I still have the cheapest one. Perfect. And I just monitor the auction house. I'm not going to flip through it right now, actually, while I'm at it. The reason why I'm in Booty Bay is because I am... Oh, my scope actually is off the auction house. Good thing I checked so I can throw this up here for 25 gold. Perfect. And then I shouldn't need to worry about that for a little while longer. Um, but yeah, so I always check, like for instance, on here I have Auctionator. And on my shopping list, I have down of Fiery Wrath. Scroll down... Anything good? No, no, no. 23 fire pants. Not terrible. Um, nothing I really want. All that's like really expensive. Shadow damage. Yeah, none of this. And then let's see. What about horde side? Uh, crap, wrong. This is the one that I usually do all my shopping on. Uh, of fiery wrath. Look down here. Any of this good? 17, 2. Yeah, nothing really. And then shadow damage. Yeah, there's not a lot of great stuff for sale in the auction house right now, as we can see. But every once in a while, if you just keep checking this, you know, every few hours, just pop over. Obviously, I know other people aren't going to have auction house alts, right? But if you are interested in getting that stuff, just 
get Auctionator type of Fiery Wrath of Shadow Wrath. Whenever you pass through a main city, go in there, click these two, just look at like the really cheap options, see are any of these good. If they are, boom, snap by them. You don't need to fork out, you know, a small fortune on getting, in this case, 26 fire pants, which aren't even good. Um, I can't believe this guy's trying to sell it for 35 gold. You're never going to get 35 gold for that. Uh, anyways, back to 60 upgrades. Um, so that's pretty much it. If we look at what I have down for bracers, I actually, I would change this in hindsight. Um, I think this and then greater than equal to that so lev's oil stain bindings is what i previously had this is it's it's difficult because on one hand yes this has additional stamina and intellect you're losing a lot of the the school uh damage it's a tough call. In fact, actually, I'm I'm going to change that and just put I'm gonna put Phoenix bindings below. And I'm going to put equals. And then let's take a look at the first sergeant's silk cuffs. This loses a lot of spell damage, but you're getting a decent amount of survivability in terms of stamina. So this is like a more balanced option. You have some Stam, some Int, even MP5 there. This has a little bit more stamina, and it also has a tiny amount of intellect. I could definitely see an argument in favor of Lev's Oil Stain Bindings. I personally am just not willing to sacrifice that much spell damage just to get a tiny bit of extra stamina. But, I I mean, it, it's difficult to say. Like, obviously... This is just better. But for the balance setup, I would probably put this here as the next best option instead of the other ones. But as for which one you run, it's really tough. It's a tough call, right? Uh, I'm just running with the spell damage ones for now because they're not that much worse. It's not like the difference between Blood Rot Cloak and the plus 14 ones. You're losing a bit additional... Uh, spell damage, and you're losing comparatively more stamina and intellect than on the bracers, so a little bit more flexible. Now, weapons. This is simultaneously a complicated discussion and a very easy discussion. The very easy discussion is just get Glimmering Gizmo Blade. This thing is fucking crazy. This is your best in slot, and it's not even close. It is so much better than literally any other weapon that you could possibly get. And you can pair it with basically any offhand, and it is good. Actually, scratch that. You can pair it with any single offhand in the game within reason, right? Obviously, if you're like, oh, what if I just run like a level one offhand? Yeah, well, that's not what I mean. Any good offhand around this level, if you have Glimmering Gizmo Blade, you are running this bar none. Because... You know, for comparison, right? This is only 19 spell damage and healing. It is only 7 spell damage on its own behind Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker, a two-hand staff. And the best in slot from Phase 1, Tome of Cavern Lore, is plus 7. So even if you only have the offhands from Phase 1, which you shouldn't, because we'll talk about that in a second, there's a lot of better ones that you can very easily get, Glimmering Gizmo Blade is already nuts. So there isn't really much of a discussion to be had as to what your best in slot setup is. This is the case for every single build. It wants this exact combo with some exceptions. Offhands are a little trickier, but this is pretty easy. Now, obviously, if you don't have Glimmering Gizmo Blade, it's a little bit more complicated. And for that, we need to take a look at this setup that I've gotten down here. Um, do I have, I have an Umbral Crystal on here, perfect. So, for two-handers, the first thing that I wanna talk about is Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker versus Staff of Jordan versus Staff of the Evil Genius. And I like, I guess we could talk about some of the other ones, but here's the thing, Spellforce Rod, 
there is like no reason to ever play any of these other ones. If you do not have any of these three two-handers, you should not be running a two-hander. Because as we'll see down here, I think I, I'm being a little bit unfair to Staff of the Evil Genius in this ranking. Uh, I think it's a little bit better than I'm giving it credit for. Actually, yeah, I'm going to change that. I've kind of changed my mind on it. I was a little bit negative on it early on. Plus... Where do I want to put this? I think I'm going to put this over here. Yeah. So, okay, let's let's talk Staff of the, the Evil Genius, because this is pretty much the trickiest thing when it comes to evaluating weapons this phase. So, we get 20 damage from this, which is lower than basically any other setup here. This is the same that you get from Spellforce Rod, which is some random world drop. This is dog shit. You shouldn't use this. I'm putting it on here just for completion's sake. But all of the stuff below it, I've just put here for fun. You know, you're going to see these in the auction house. You may think to yourself, gee whiz, I wonder if I should invest in getting a fiery Shadow Wrath staff. The answer is no. No, you should not. It is literally worth zero gold to you. Never get that. Because they are just not good two-handers. And as we can see here, the highest two-hander that I have on here is Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker equals um, Staff of the Evil Genius. And I, you know, just changed that. And Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker and Staff of Jordan are identical, for the record. They have very minor differences. They're effectively the same item. So I'm not putting Staff of Jordan in this, like, full breakdown. Anywhere that you see Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker, which, well, is right here, this is effectively Staff of Jordan. I might as well just add it. Staff of Jordan, just for comprehension, or, or being comprehensive, right? Can't hurt. Um, so, this is where I would put it. I think they're roughly all equal. But you'll notice that there are a lot of other setups with one-handers above it. Now, comparing the three of these, for starters, never spend money on this either. Staff of Jordan is not a bad item, obviously, but just like you have no reason to take these, you know, plus 27 shadow damage things, there's absolutely no reason to ever spend any significant amount of money on this. Now, if you could buy a Staff of Jordan for 15 gold or 20 gold, I would say that's probably worth it. Unfortunately, nobody wants to sell their Staff of Jordan for 15 or 20 gold. Every single person is trying to sell their Staff of Jordan for, on my server at least, bare minimum like 150 gold. Most people are looking for 300 gold because they're frankly delusional. You know, Staff of Jordan is an insane item in original classic, but Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker exists. And Black Fathom Deeps is insanely easy to clear. And this item is genuinely better than Staff of Jordan. Not equivalent, really. I, I've put it, I put it equivalent because... For all the stuff that matters, they are identical. But if push comes to shove, right, you can't even make an argument for Staff of Jordan of like, oh, well, if we're really, really, really min-maxing and we're, you know, really picking at hairs and saying which one has slightly more stats, technically Staff of Jordan comes out ahead because it doesn't. This one does. So this isn't even better than a very easy to get drop, right? And I, I guess very easy to get is... Maybe not the most accurate statement, because it is a purple, right? You do need to run Black Fathom Deeps and get lucky, but Black Fathom Deeps is completely free now. So, I think for most people, I don't need to explain that, but if you are a brand new player, and I, I'm, I've talked to some people like this, so don't feel bad, right? I know that, you know, not everybody is super comfortable joining groups and stuff like that, and... I would imagine if you do fall into that category and you are watching this video to maybe like work your way up to uh, getting to Nomergon and like, you know, build your confidence and make sure you understand as much as you possibly can before you set fun the raid, you may still be nervous about Black Fathom Deeps. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, pugging Black Fathom Deeps this phase is piss easy. It is actually kind of impossible to wipe. 
I don't think I've wiped a single time in Black Fathom Deeps, even while like using it to level my characters, like when I was leveling my Paladin. You just like can't really fuck up any of the bosses as long as you have a raid where people are above level 25. If every single person is level 25, sure. But if you are just running Black Fathom Deeps on your level 40 Warlock to get a few different items, which there are some items you may want to get, which we will discuss. Um, namely, this or... Uh, where is... X out two hands. Uh, I don't know what the hell this is. This is just something in the files, but it doesn't actually exist. But Dagger of Willing Sacrifice. This is obviously better, in my opinion, than the Epic Staff, if you can combo it with a good offhand. But... Basically, if you're farming this at level 40, you will be able to just steamroll the entire raid and get really good chances at any of these pieces. And you can do that every three days. It's not hard to farm if you really want to. But realistically speaking, if you are farming Black Fathom Deeps, you are hoping to get Dagger of Rolling Sacrifice. And if the Epic Staff drops, you're like, sure, okay, I guess I can kind of use that too in the meantime, assuming you don't have a good offhand. So... It's something. Now, the real comparison, because now that we've already said Staff of Jordan is just not worth the money, is Sleepwalker versus Evil Genius. And it really is just the hit, right? That's what it boils down to. So the thing about Hit Chance this phase is that it is impossible for us to reach max uh, hit rating, even if we have Staff of the Evil Genius. So... We're always going to get 1% hit from our belt. I'll discuss the different options later, but one of the reasons why Volatile Concoction is so good, which, you know, we'll talk about, is because of the 1% hit. Because it is one of the only reliable ways to get 1% hit. The other way that we're going to get 1% hit, pretty much guaranteed, is with our Hyperconductive 2-piece. So we're always going to have 2% additional hit. Now, there are some other ways to get it that aren't necessarily... Super recommended, for instance, Irradiated Boots also comes with 1% hit. So what you could do is run Chest Pants for your tier to get the 1% off the 2-piece, and then drop the 3-piece proc bonus, and instead take Irradiated Boots for the 1% hit, and now you have 3% hit total. But even if you do all of that, in Nomergon, you need to get 5% hit chance to not have a chance of getting a resist. Now, that being said, no matter what spell you cast, there is an innate in classic 1% chance that your spell gets resisted. It kind of sucks. You can be fighting a level 1 and you can get a resist. It's a 1 out of 100 chance. But outside of that innate resistance chance, you need to hit 5% hit rating for all of your spells to be guaranteed. And we cannot reach that. Even if we do exactly what I just described, Two-piece with chest pants, Volatile Concoction, Irradiated Boots for 3%, and run Staff of the Evil Genius, which, mind you, would require you to drop Glimmering Dismal Blade, which this thing is nuts, so ignoring whether or not it's worth it to drop Glimmering Gizmo Blade, hint, it's not, uh, you still would not be at hit cap. Now, that being said, the hit is good, kind of, as a result of that, so... Yes, you could make the argument that, like, if you don't have Gizmo Blade, this is a solid option. But eh? if this allowed us to guarantee that none of our stuff got resisted, then it would become significantly more valuable. I still think that it would be worse than Glimmering Gizmo Blade. I don't think it would be worse than Glimmering Gizmo Blade, but it would be a significantly more viable pick if a two-hand running Staff of the Evil Genius setup could not have any chance to miss. Because that is really, really, really nice. Not having that chance to get a really nasty resist that fucks you. And one of the reasons why it kind of doesn't matter is because you still do have that 1 in 100 chance anyways. So that disaster scenario can happen to anybody, no matter what their hit chance is. So I don't know. It's a difficult thing to evaluate. I'm sure that, you know, some people have calculated what the average um, value of hit chance is, which is why this probably says it's worth 41 Warlock EP, whatever the equivalency points. I don't know exactly how the calculations work, but one of the worst things that you can do when gearing is blindly following stuff like this. Plus 21. Wow. 
This is plus 21. Plus 21 what? EP. What is EP? Equivalency points. What does that mean? And like, I am sure that there is some math that went into figuring out how to weight all of the stuff because like what, what this actually does mean, I can show you. If we go to equivalency points, there's different weights given to all of this stuff, how much to value every single stat. But you can see there's a very heavy value placed on spell hit. But one of the other things that I don't necessarily know if this is taking into account is obviously after you hit max hit chance, spell hit is worthless, right? Because now you don't need it at all. So every single point of hit is not necessarily weighted the same. And this is not taken into account when it's doing this stuff. So just generally speaking, the worst thing that you can do for yourself is blindly following numbers like this, plus 21. There's an add-on, one, one of my most hated World of Warcraft add-ons in both classic and retail is Pawn. If you have Pawn, install or uninstall it right now. It is a garbage add-on. You should not rely on it. It's like one of those like, plus 300 percent increase and the amount of times i've heard people blindly citing pawn percent increase numbers to me on whether or not something is an upgrade to them drives me up the fucking wall it is somewhat understandable in retail when a lot of things are just raw stats in retail everything is item level frankly you shouldn't even be using pawn in retail because a lot of times, really, you just equip the highest item level. Aside from specific things like trinkets, obviously, but, you know, this is a classic gearing thing, not a retail gearing thing. I'm not going to talk about the intricacies of retail gearing. But in classic, it makes even less sense because there are so many items in classic that are really good despite having really weird stat lines and can't really be mathematically evaluated properly, right? So... I'm not saying that, you know, this is incorrect, that this staff is good, but I'm saying that the fact that this says 41 and this says 30 means absolutely fuck all. Don't read into this, right? They're both roughly the same in terms of value. If you have really low hit, this is probably better, but realistically speaking, you're going to want to run a one hand and off hand anyways. And speaking of which, for one hands... We've already talked about Dagger of Rolling Sacrifice, but the last one-hander that I want to talk about is Hypnotic Blade. Hypnotic Blade drops off Scarlet Monastery Library. This thing gives you plus nine spell damage and healing. It's not that good. It is a good bit worse than Dagger of Rolling Sacrifice, but you'll see on here, I have it on here, Hypnotic Blade plus Orb of the Forgotten Seer, Orb of the Forgotten Seer words, being um, this thing. And similarly, this drops off Blood Mage Thalnos. It has a 50% chance to drop. You're probably going to be running a lot of Graveyard while leveling up. I would say that 90% of Warlocks are just going to get this by default while leveling through Scarlet Monastery. It's... you find a million of these things. And it is a very, very good offhand. So basically, every single person should have this. It's super easy to get your hands on it. If you hit level 40 and you do not have this, go solo Scarlet Monastery Graveyard because you can do it very easily as a meta lock as i said i even have a video on that right you can get your rare drop items the ghost shard talisman and the forgotten seer orb lots of good stuff from graveyard that you can very easily get completely on your own and this is definitely your prebus offhand plus 12 to magic and healing and if we look at the general overview Hypnotic Blade plus Orb of the Forgotten Seer gives you 21 spell power. Now, that is definitely the worst of the quote-unquote good setups. But one thing that I think is worth noting is that this is significantly better than anything below it. So while this is like only slightly worse than Dagger of Rolling Sacrifice, I say slightly in damage sense. Keep in mind that it doesn't have armor. Dagger of Rolling Sacrifice does have armor and stamina, so... In terms of tanking, this is so much better than Hypnotic Blade, but in terms of damage, it's like, eh. Give and take. And technically speaking, if you don't have either of these two daggers, you're not going to have armor on your weapon anyway, because at that point, you'll be using one of the two-handers, either Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker or Staff of Evil Genius, and neither one of these have armor either, so kind of a moot point, right? There's a reason why these two daggers are fucking crazy, and everything else is just like, what are you going to use until you get your hands on one of these two things? But 
Hypnotic Blade plus Orb of the Forgotten Seer is at least pretty good. And if you get like offhand upgrades, so the technically best offhand Necronomicon, um, this thing gives you plus 14 to spell damage and healing. And honestly, the stats on it aren't amazing, but you're mostly taking it for that plus 14. And it's the only flat plus 14 offhand. So especially for a balance build where you're, you know, valuing healing as well, it's pretty nice. And now we have to talk about the uh, other offhand. So just real quick in terms of like balance setups, this is where I would rank things. Glimmering Gizmo Blade plus Necronomicon. Glimmering Gizmo Blade plus Orb of the Forgotten Seer. And then Glimmering Gizmo Blade plus literally anything else. I mean, even if you only have like Tome of Cavern lore, it is still better than um, any other option. That's just how good Glimmering Gizmo Blade is. It's broken. And then Dagger of Rolling Sacrifice plus Necronomicon is still a really strong option. And... If you happen to have Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker, you can consider running it for pure damage over other combinations of Dagger of Willing Sacrifice. But I will note, Dagger of Willing Sacrifice, if you value survivability, which quite honestly you should, in my opinion, Dagger of Willing Sacrifice plus Orb of the Forgotten Seer is pretty much your best in slot setup pre-raid until you get your hands on anything better for either slot, either Necronomicon or, of course, Glimmering Gizmo Blade. Don't fuck around with two-handers. Only fuck around with two-handers if you somehow, for, you know, not for lack of trying, just can't get your hands on Dagger Willing Sacrifice. It just doesn't exist for you, and you need to rely on some other two-hander. Um, go for Rod of the Ancient Sleepwalker. Go for Staff of the Evil Genius. If you can't even get your hands on that, then you just fall back on the very easy setup of Hypnotic Blade and Orb of the Forgotten Seer. So every single person and their mother should be able to get this setup right here. But there's a lot of other better options that you can get pre-raid. Now, now that we've talked about the, the balance stuff, we got to talk about the odd orbs out. Namely, let's look at fire for this one. Orb of Noah Rahel and Umbral Crystal. And of course, Firestone, but Firestone is... Firestone's fucking weird. So, Firestone is... I talked about this in some of my other Warlock videos. Firestone is identical in terms of spell damage to Orb of Noah Rahil. It is not good. If you have not yet completed this quest, the completed orb, or whatever that chain is, make sure that you pick the fire one. The shadow one, you do not want. You do not want to take the uh, the Orb of Dar Rahil. You do not want this thing. This is bad. This is really, 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 really bad. The fire one is good, specifically for this pure fire damage setup. For the pure fire damage setup, this is your abyss. If you have Necronomicon, it is effectively equal to Orb of Noah Rahil. They do the same, except the added stats in this are better. So this obviously has more intellect than Necronomicon, and we don't give a shit about spirit or plus three shadow resistance, so this is better for, you know, general stat stuff. And of course, the on-use effect in a pinch can be really nice if you're, I don't know, like spiraling out of control on electrocution or you desperately need like a heal. This is a lot of health restoration in an emergency, so it's really, really nice to have and you're not losing any damage for it. So for the fire damage setup, this is the no-brainer best option. Always take this. Do not use Firestone unless you fucked up and took Orb of Dar or Rahil, because, I mean, everybody should be able to get this. So the only way you don't have this is if you fucked up and picked the wrong quest. If you did, I'm sorry, it is what it is. Then you can, I guess, use Firestone for pure fire damage, but um, the moment you have Necronomicon, you should be running that. So Necro Firestone, Necronomicon, Orb of Noah Rahil for pure fire damage. And for shadow damage, Umbral Crystal is technically your best, right? Because this gives you plus 17, and the other stuff gives you only 14. Now, a few problems with Umbral Crystal. One problem that you won't hear me saying 
is that, oh, well, shadow damage, it's only for a mechanical menagerie, so survivability isn't a concern. Well, as it so happens, Umbral Crystal also comes with five stamina, which you may notice is more than the Necronomicon. Now, you know, uh, uh, you could maybe argue that if you had Orb of Dararahil, it would be slightly better than Necronomicon for Mechanical Menagerie. I guess use it if you did happen to pick it up. But realistically, we're comparing Umbral Crystal to Necronomicon because those are the two good ones. And this actually is better for survivability, technically speaking, than Necronomicon because the stamina is actually quite nice. Now, keep in mind, you are losing out on the healing. So you're not benefiting from additional Master Channeler healing, which technically means it's slightly worse in that regard for survivability. But as I said before, a lot of the damage on Menagerie that is really scary is very bursty. It's overheat or cluck. And in that scenario, you want more upfront damage mitigation or stuff like stamina to give your healers more time to heal you. Increased trickle healing from Master Channeler in that particular fight is really not going to make it that big of a deal. So I would actually say that for Menagerie, this is just better than Necronomicon, if we're being real. Now, what is the problem with Umbral Crystal? Well, let's take a peek. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, is it any better on the Alliance Auction House? Umbral Crystal? Ooh, not much better. Not a whole lot better there in terms of pricing. So you may see the problem. Now, as it so happens, I have an Umbral Crystal on my Horde character. I bought it for 26 gold, and I the moment it went up, I just so happened to refresh like the moment it got posted, and I saw it for 26 gold, I bought it, I'm going to be honest, I am still debating even using this. Because as I said, this is better than Necronomicon. So like, it is technically an upgrade for me. But even I have to sit here and wonder, ooh, do I want a slight damage increase on Mechanical Menagerie? Or do I want 100 gold? Tough decision. And honestly, it might be worth more on other servers as well. So that is the real cost of running Umbral Crystal. While it is technically speaking better for one fight in a level 40 raid, you are losing a lot of money for it. And the reason for that is, of course, because Shadow Priest is fucking crazy right now, and Umbral Crystal is best in slot for Shadow Priest. So every single Shadow Priest has a massive hard-on for Umbral Crystal and is willing to pay up the ass for it, which means that it makes it kind of hard for us to get our hands on it. So, if you're like me, and you happen to buy one for super cheap, and, and frankly, 26 gold, it may sound like a lot, but for an item like that, as you can see, it is pretty cheap. And, you know, you don't really feel like reselling it? I guess you can use it. And especially if you don't have Necronomicon and you happen to get your hands on an Umbral Crystal really early, it's pretty good. So... <laughs> trade-offs I would also say that like you know of course for for a balanced setup it's not bad because generally speaking this balanced setup right like the the fire damage setup is assuming that you're running the deep destro build the shadow damage setup as I've said is geared specifically towards damage on mechanical menagerie the balanced and survival builds while not explicitly built for demonology, are kind of assuming you're playing demonology, if that makes sense. Like, you could technically speaking run the balance setup with the fire damage build, the deep destruction one, and it would be good for deep destro, it just wouldn't be quite as good as the dedicated fire damage build. But this is the best in slot gear effectively for demonology, because demonology just doesn't really care. Demo uses a mix of fire and shadow, it has dots that it applies, which are shadow. It uses searing pain a good amount, but not like 70% of its overall. So it wants basically a 50-50 split between fire and shadow, which means that it values raw spell damage a lot more than the other two playstyles because it doesn't want to take specific school damage. And of course, the survivability setup that we discussed here, well, 
if you are playing for survivability, you are almost certainly going to be running the Soul Link Demonology build. So pretty much the only universe in which you actually run this gear set is if you're already playing Soul Link anyway. And one of the reasons why I think this is overkill is Soul Link is so ludicrously powerful that if you have it on, you're already just not going to die. So there is basically no reason to really build for survivability on a Soul Link build because you're just making an unkillable build even more unkill, which just doesn't really make a lot of sense. At that point, your survivability is already taken care of just by nature of taking that talent setup. Just build for damage and help out your group. Or better yet, play for like Demonic Pact, right? And try to buff your group's damage because you're already playing, you know, a you know tanky setup. You can then help your group mates and buff their damage, which in many cases might give you more overall damage. And keep in mind that the way Demonic Pact works, right? So your pet's critical strikes apply the Demonic Pact effect. This increases the spell damage and healing by 10% of your spell damage. Now, this does not affect, or this is not affected by school spell damage. It is only the flat spell damage, so spell damage and healing, right? So if you are running Demonic Pact, you do not want to have a single plus fire or plus shadow item because you are losing value that you could be giving to your party members. So kind of like I said, these builds are geared towards uh, demonology setups that are probably going to be running Demonic Pact like that. Um, both the survival one and the balanced one. I would recommend this one. You can run the survival one, um, is what it is, right? But, you know, that's kind of why, like, technically speaking, in this balanced setup, you can justify Umbral Crystal, kind of, in the sense that you would get a decent amount of damage out of it, but, and, like, and the survivability, right? But kind of, as we just said, while you may be losing a little bit of personal damage by running Necronomicon in like a shadow damage heavy balance setup, if you have Demonic Pact, you are going to be gaining more overall damage for your group. So for Demonology, it's just not really useful even though they use a lot of shadow damage. Honestly, I'd say even Orb of the Forgotten Seer is better for Demonic Pact just because of the reasons that we've already stated. So in a sense, Umbral Crystal is an investment purely for Menagerie. Once again, if you want to make that investment, up to you. I will go on record and say that it is not a bad investment. It is a good item for that fight. It is just a very steep price to pay for doing slightly better on one particular boss. I don't know. I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> Considering I have one and I'm not using it. Um, I've been trying to resell it, but... Choice is up to you, right? Anyways, moving on, we have gloves. So, let's take a look at what I have for gloves on here. Uh, here we go. Dreamweave gloves, Fighter Ace gloves, Stormcloth gloves, Black Mage Weave gloves, and there's just a bunch of random ones here. So, obviously, we've kind of already talked about the fact that the fire damage setup will want to run this. This is pure damage. I don't really think it's that much better. Honestly, like I said, this is really, really, really greedy. I don't really think there is any justification for actually using this, right? Because Dreamweave Gloves are plus 18. So you are only running that plus 20 fire damage uh, gloves if you are a massive parse whore like me, though it is better. Dreamweave Gloves in any realistic setting are going to give you more damage. And I, I think I kind of talked about this a little bit already, but the next best option, in my opinion, would be Fighter Ace Gloves. So you have some of these other ones. This gives you 17 shadow damage. This is pretty bad because it's just almost... It, it literally is a strictly worse Dreamweave Gloves. You really should never use this. This gives you plus 15. So if Dreamweave Gloves are a little bit too expensive, you could maybe get Black Mage Weave, but uh, same with this. Red Mage Weave. Like, a lot of these items, people use them for leveling up. They're tailoring, so it's like really cheap in the auction house. Whereas Dreamweave gloves, like if we check prices, they were more expensive at the start of the phase. But Dreamweave gloves, it's like one of the first items, is around ten gold on my server. I know for a fact that it's pretty much the same on Horde, so I'm not gonna go and check there. Now, ten gold is like not a lot, which is why I would say that this is worth the investment, right? Like, don't skimp out on your gloves just because oh, it's a slight bit of extra gold. It's a slight bit of extra gold, but it's an item that you're going to be using for the entire phase, pretty much. Unless you happen to get Fighter Ace Gloves and you really want that added survivability, 
for damage, this is realistically your best option for everything. So the cost really is not that bad, in my opinion. And if we look at like, you know, black mage, weave gloves. Uh, yeah, it's like one gold, red mage, weave gloves. Yeah, this is actually way more expensive. Definitely not worth. I don't know how this guy thinks anybody's going to buy that. Uh, but like we can see there, black mage weave. That is obviously very cheap. So I think a lot of people may be tempted. Like I saved nine gold if I buy this one and it's only three spell damage less. But at the same time, you know, you can't put a price on this, right? Sometimes you can. If that price is 150 gold, you can maybe be like, maybe not Umber Crystal. But the difference between one gold and 10 gold is a lot different than, you know, 150 gold. So... I would say it's worth it to invest in Dreamweave Gloves. I really think they're good. I think it's definitely worth it. Um, yeah, pretty much. Uh, and then, yeah, like I already said, Fighter Ace versus Dreamweave is really personal preference. This is more damage. This is significantly more survivability, if we're being frank. It's a good chunk of extra armor and stamina. And the intellect is not bad either. So this is definitely where you're going to want to run for parses. I, like, I personally, I have not gotten Fighter Ace Gloves, so I have not, I have not had the moral dilemma of, do I keep being a greedy asshole, or do I put on the gloves that have 111 armor? I have not had to cross that bridge yet. And I think for the remainder of Nomergon, I will probably continue to use Dreamweave Gloves and my stupid plus 20 fire damage gloves for parses, just because, because, like, it's easy, we steamroll it at this point. But if I was being honest, and I'm, like, leveling up in dungeons... And I'm like, which pair of gloves do I think is better for doing gigantic dungeon leveling pulls? I'm going to be real. I'm probably taking Fighter Ace gloves. I've convinced myself. I actually think this is better for a balanced setup. So I still think that Dreamweave gloves is worth the investment because it is still very good. But they're, they're, it's really close. I just think that if survivability is ever a concern, you are getting a significant amount from this to where I believe it is worth using over this. Just because this has no stamina, which feels really bad. The armor is honestly less of a concern than the six stamina, though it, the armor is something. Okay, now Volo Concoction Belt. Hmm. Or uh, belt slots in general. So first, let's take a peek back at what I have on here. You can see here, I have them set to equals. And I stand by this. They are basically dead even. And you can see that on the fire damage build, I had this as the actual bis. On all the other builds, I have this one as the bis. Uh, the only build where I don't believe that hyperconductive gold wrap is actually the bis, and it's close. It, it is still the second bis, but Volta Concoction is very clearly ahead is pure shadow damage. For pure shadow damage, I do not think you take hyperconductive gold wrap because your dots can't crit. At least your dots can't crit yet. But, you know, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see what things may potentially happen in phase 3. But if pretty much all of your damage is from dots, then you're not really getting much out of the crit uh strike increase, so it's just better to make your dots hit harder. Now, you could argue that the crit helps you with improved Shadow Bolt getting that effect and getting the shadow damage increase, but I don't think that's enough to justify it, in my opinion. But it is very close, right? Like, I think no matter what, this is still your second best option for pure shadow damage, but I believe that this is better. But for fire damage, like, getting big crits, getting those massive Searing Pain crits is the entire purpose of this build. If your hyperconductive gold wrap is off cooldown, you absolutely want to fish for that 3%. But, of course, we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is that it is a chance, right? You flip it, you have a 50-50 chance of either getting the 3% crit or the 10% movement speed. And if you get the 10% movement speed, well, that fucking sucks, right? There's no way around that. It sucks. It really feels bad to get 10% movement speed. But what you might notice is, uh, like I said, don't follow these numbers blindly, but it still ranks them equally. And that's because even if this doesn't have any spell damage, and even if the proc, or not proc, the on use on it, is only a 50-50 chance of working, 
It still has nine stamina, which is really, really, really nice. This is more than Valder Concoction Belts. And I would actually say survivability-wise, they're dead even. Right? They are pretty much dead even. The only reason that I would put this ahead is just because of the healing. So this gives you slightly more healing, which is why I put it in the survivability setup. But this gives you not really that much less armor and slightly more stamina. So I would say they're roughly comparable. They both give you 1% hit. And this gives you 1% flat hit or flat uh, critical strike even outside of the on-use effect. So you're getting 1% flat crit and then 3% if you roll heads. So this is just a good belt to have, even if you get movement speed every single time. If you took the on-use effect out of the picture, it would be significantly worse, not significantly, it would be worse for sure than Vault of Concoction Belt, but it would not be bad. And I would actually probably still say it's better than Highlander's Cloth Girdle. Probably, though it would be much closer. But the main reason, of course, that you are running Hyperconductive Gold Wrap is you are hoping to get that 3% crit, because getting 3% additional crit on pull along, like you're obviously macroing this into um, your helmet. So the way I have it is I uh, have this and then slash whisper bozo priest pi me. Um, not an actual priest, but you know, fuck priests, right? I hope none of the priests in my guild watch this video. Um, I love you guys, by the way. Banter, you're awesome. Love you. Um, I, I totally didn't mean that. That was just a joke, you know? I, I've been ganked by way too many Shadow Priests. I'm just, I'm fucking tilted at Priests. Um, anyways, so obviously macroing that together and getting 3% crit with this odd use effect, which is an insane odd use effect, an insane amount of damage is going to come from your opener. And like, if you go look at some of my logs where I hit the 3% crit, I just pop the fuck off my damage goes through the roof it is nuts so with the destro setup yes it is rng but it is undoubtedly insane if you manage to land it and if you do land the three percent crit it is significantly better than volo concoction belt so if that is a trade-off you want to make I don't know. Um like I said because dots can't crit it's not actually as good for shadow damage um, as for a balance setup, honest, they're like pretty comparable for like a regular balance setup because like it's kind of fine. It's whatever, right? Um, so really like now that we've gotten that out of the way, I, one thing I will say real quick though about Hyperconductive Gold Wrap, while this is really good, as I've kind of pointed out, Volva Concoction Belt is very comparable. Very, very, very comparable. If you are going for rank one parses, you will not be able to get rank one parses without hyperconductive gold wrap. That's just how it is, right? Um, and actually, that, that's not necessarily true. You have a much better chance of getting rank one parses or really high parses with hyperconductive gold wrap. Technically speaking, crit RNG is crit RNG. So I believe actually the best way to go for rank one parses as a warlock is not to run hyperconductive gold wrap and actually to run enchanting and run the sigil of innovation or whatever because that's guaranteed spell damage and then you just hope that you get more crits they're probably about even so i guess if you want to run enchanting if you're not engineer then of course this is your better option um now of course i am an engineer and i don't really get a choice in the matter because here's the thing this character my warlock this is the one with the sniper scope recipe so this warlock is worth 400 gold this warlock's engineering is worth 400 gold i don't get a choice i don't get to change this if i respect to enchanting for slightly more damage i lose a recipe that i paid 400 gold for you know professions are just really fucking annoying you know this is my gnome i gotta play ng on it um yeah but technically speaking, if you are running enchanting and you're not a gnome and you don't really give a shit about having engineering, uh, another thing is like gadgets aren't really that impactful right now. So I do think one thing that you should consider is that in phase three, engineering will get a massive amount of value. Basically, all of the really good engineering items are not available right now because Blizzard made it impossible to access. And because of like easy throw dynamite and the fact that we are barely below the threshold for all of the good bombs 
it's actually really not that much of a damage loss to use easy throw dynamite over the actual engineering dynamite. So, yeah, outside of hyperconductive gold wrap, engineering really doesn't have a lot going for it at the immediate moment, unless you're like me and you're using it as a gold making profession, which I think applies to approximately zero people watching this video. So if you want, if you already have engineering, if you like having engineering and you think it's a fun profession, which I get that, you know, preaching to the choir, uh, then by all means make hyperconductive gold wrap. I think that you will find that it is worth the investment. If you are not an engineer, do not feel compelled to go out and get hyperconductive gold wrap because it is not that much better. Um, it is not a very big investment. It's not super hard to craft. If I look at, um, so I think all the way, where is the recipe for it here? There we go. Um, it's not that expensive. I like right now it says 23 gold, but see the auction house, my last update still has this at two gold. It's worth like 70 silver on my server now. Um, this is still worth about two gold. This is, well, yeah, see, it's valuing this at seven gold. Faintly glowing leather is worth about one gold on my server now. Gold bars, you know, that's not really that expensive. So hyperconductive gold wrap, at least by my server's prices, is around 10 to 15 gold to craft. Uh, your prices may vary. I don't know what your server is. My server tends to have very little inflation. So... It's probably more for other people. So I, I don't really think it's that bad of an investment if you already have engineering. But, you know, if you're trying to save gold and you want to look for one opportunity to not buy something, I would not worry about buying this. Um, also, I just realized. Is that the name on this is like it's it, hyperconductive gold WAP. WAP. The actual item name is correct, but the... <laughs> description of the engineering thing is gold wop just noticed that um but yeah like basically investing in hell investing in umbral crystal is probably nah actually i don't know about that um investing in umbral crystal is still a, a really big investment investing in dreamweave gloves is like the investment that i would recommend that i think is worth it hyperconductive is like you can take it or leave it it's not really like that important as for other belts, so I really don't think there's any reason to run a plus fire or plus shadow damage belt. You can see I have it on here, right? There's just better options, and really there's only two other ones that I, I want to talk about, uh, namely Star Belt, which is just flat 13 spell damage and healing, compared to Volado Concoction, that is slightly more, so... This competes in terms of that raw damage, but of course this is missing hit, right? So overall, in terms of survivability and damage, it's significantly worse, but this is a very good pre-raid option. It's a little bit expensive in my experience. If I check the auction house, um, star belts. Yeah, okay, so it's actually still really pricey. Eight golds, um, is Alliance any better? Star belts, oof really 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 pricey still that that actually kind of surprises me um i thought the prices would go down so yeah that's that's a little bit problematic and one of the other issues is that there aren't many better options pre-raid so like death mage sash is okay i guess it's probably your next best choice it has a lot of intellect which is fine it's not really that much better for damage, or it's not better for damage, but it's not really that much better for, like, survivability. It's like... Eh. If you don't want to spend on Star Belt and you're unable to get Highlander's Cloth Belt, which I'll talk about, um, I guess get Death Mage Sash. As for this, um, one thing, let me double check for... I always get this confused. Yeah, the, the Arathi Basin Boots are at Revered, and the Arathi Basin Belt is at Honored. What are the... What's the other Arathi Basin thing? Yeah, it's... it. Um, no, this is... This is Honor Ranks, right? So that's a completely different thing. That's like, you know, your Honor level. Uh, is it just Belt and Boots for Arathi Basin at this level? I think it is. 
I'm just double checking to make sure I haven't forgotten anything. I believe it is just that. And then you get a lot more stuff at level 60, but that's a moot point right now. Um, yeah, so this is easier to get. One of the issues, right, like, you know, I'll talk about it when we get to boots, but like for survival, I put the Arathi Basin things here. That requires Revered. And while you will probably want to slowly work towards getting Exalted with Arathi Basin eventually, because it has a lot of good level 60 items, we don't really get much at all from Arathi Basin until level 60. Like, the, the rewards just aren't amazing. They're not bad, but we just have better options. And who knows, maybe we just won't get anything good for belts or boots at level 50, and they will end up being, like, one of the two will end up being our best in slot. But right now, like, the boots are just not good enough, in my opinion, to really justify. Like, unless you are going for, you really want that added stamina and armor. I'm kind of skipping ahead here a little bit, but whatever. Uh, unless you really, really want that added stamina and armor, you have to drop your tier piece bonus for it, which in my opinion is just makes it not worth it in any realistic setup. So, there's no point in going all the way to Revered. The belt is a little bit more accessible, and it does have a lot of armor. So that's something, but it has less stamina. So it has significantly less stamina than Gold Wrap. It has still less stamina than Concoction and only slightly more armor. And it's providing you with a tiny bit of extra spell damage, but you're losing the hit chance. And the big thing here is the hit chance, right? So the hit chance alone makes these two belts bis. Uh, really, no other belt can actually compete. And they are also very strong for survivability, so you do not feel bad taking either one of these. Which is why, even in the survivability setup, you still run this. And I would still, for survivability, say that this is second best. Right, this has a lot of armor, but a lot of people get too hyper fixated on armor. You get diminishing returns on armor after some time. Like, it doesn't give you that much. And the thing about armor is, like, what did I just say before about Menagerie, right? Armor doesn't help you for overheat damage. A lot of the scariest sources of damage are completely irrelevant when it comes to armor. Like, it just it doesn't do anything for you. It's still good to have armor, right? Because every boss is going to auto-attack you. So if you're taking a shit ton of overheat damage and you're completely naked and you have no armor, you're also going to get shredded by the auto-attacks. So it's important to have a certain amount of armor to mitigate Menagerie's auto-attacks so that, you know, you don't get completely comboed by overheat. But... That alone is not going to save you. Stacking a shit ton of armor is not going to just suddenly make you invincible. You need a balance of armor, stamina, and when possible, resistance. Though that is much harder to budget into your gear, at least at, while leveling up. So generally speaking, you're not really going to worry about resistance and you're going to negate elemental damage with either just raw stamina or protection potions, consumables like magic resistance pot, etc., etc. Uh, anyways... Like I said before, um, I'm going to talk mostly about the tier stuff later. Since I kind of already talked about it, I will just quickly note these boots. And because I'm not really going to mention it much outside of the survivability thing. The only reason why I put it here in the survivability setup is that it does have way more armor than any of the other boots. Like, this is a lot of armor. Because if we're looking at this, like, this is 105 armor, but Concoction Belt has 77 and this is 40. Right, this all these other ones are down in the 40 range. This is all the way up at 103. It is way far ahead of any of the other options. In terms of stamina, it is also the leader. There are a lot of other boots that have good helpings of stamina on them. Um, more specifically, uh, the hyperconductive walkers, your tier set boots, which is one of the reasons why I generally wouldn't recommend this, because this is already pretty good for tankiness, anyways. It's really not bad. I don't know if one additional stamina and that armor really makes this worth it, especially because it is significantly far behind on the spell damage when you factor in the loss of that three-piece bonus. And the intellect, once again, intellect doesn't really mean a ton, but if they're basically dead even on everything but intellect, and this one has significantly less, right, nine less intellect, well, that starts to seem a little bit more appealing and it does have one less raw spell damage so for a balanced setup like it absolutely not take your three piece bonus and it's not even close i kind of said before that i genuinely generally wouldn't recommend running this survivability setup but 
if you are one of those people that is hyper fixated on armor, I guess I wanted to illustrate that this is the furthest that you should go. Anything beyond these items, if you are like sacrificing, I, I, I don't know, like anything else effectively, you know, kind of the concoction belt. If you're taking this just because of the armor, you're making a mistake, right? That's kind of what I'm willing to illustrate. I almost, I really feel bad putting this on here, but it technically is a little bit tankier. But I still would not recommend it. I think you're losing too much damage um, from it. I'll talk about all the other options later, right? Like I said, because I really, this is like an isolated case and we already talked about the Arathi stuff, but uh, the other, all of the other boot options and chest options and pants options, we kind of need to talk about that together. I'll do that at the very end. That's like the last thing I'll discuss. Um, as for rings, kind of a no-brainer. We're going to go back to the balance setup. These are your two best general purpose rings. Hypercharge gear of conflagration. You are going to be running this with every single build. It is just very good. Obviously, getting your hands on it is a different story. Now, if we look at the way that I've structured rings on here, I think this is important to note. One of your rings will always be these two, no matter what. If you do not have hypercharge gear, you'll be using the level 38 lore keepers. If you do have hypercharge gear, then, you know, the lore keepers is your next best ring. So that's kind of why I've decided to do it like this. These are your two best. You will always have these on. But if you don't have hypercharge gear, then, and this is like your best one, it gets a little bit funky after here because you can't have two of the same, right? So you can have... You can have one of these level 38 lore keepers rings and you can have a level 28 lore keepers ring but the level 38 version is unique so you can't have two level 38 lore keepers rings a lot of people get confused about that because they have the exact same name uh, the same thing is true for rune of perfection talk about when you get to trinkets you can have a level 40 and a level 20 rune of perfection but you cannot have two level 40 runes of perfection uh, so that's, I don't know, it's weird the way the Warsong Gulch rewards work, especially for rings and trinkets because of that. Uh, but yeah, so back to rings, the, basically the third best option, right? Because this is your best, this is your second best, this is your third best, is kind of a tie between, in my opinion, um, Lore Keeper's Ring and Electrocutioner Hexnut. And these are the only two that really matter because, like, technically speaking, right? If we go down here, Signet of the Twilight Lord, this is basically identical to the level 28 Lore Keepers. It has plus seven, but this is Spirit, which is worthless. This is Stamina and MP5. This is strictly better than Signet of the Twilight Lord in all situations. And as long as you have Honored with the Silverwing Sentinels, which... Let's be real. Honored Reputation with Warsong Gulch right now, extremely easy to get. That in just a few Ashen Veils you should be able to get. So every single person pre-raid should have both of their Lore Keepers rings very, very, very easily. Not even a contest, right? And if you do not get a hypercharged Gear of Conflagration and you happen to loot an extra Electrocutioner's Hex Nut, this, in my opinion, is better than the level 28 Lore Keepers. It has slightly more stamina, one more damage. You know, you lose out on the MP5, but that doesn't really matter too much. It's so close that you could effectively call it a side grade, but all three of these are like roughly equivalent. This one is like definitely a cut above. The others are like, eh, they're all roughly comparable. Um, so that's like the general purpose rings. Now, you might notice there's a few that I've kind of been refusing to acknowledge. And, uh, like, actually, I, I want to put an asterisk, um, asterisk blah, 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 next to this. And... Infernal Pact Essence. Fuck, that's not... You can only have one Blood Moon Warlock item at a time. Infernal Pact Essence is the best, and it's not even close. 
Okay, yeah, I think that that's a good enough answer. So you might notice here that I I have put Infernal Blood Coil or yeah, Infernal Blood Coil Band and Umbral Blood Seal, which are the two Warlock Blood Moon items. This one gives you eight stamina, eight intellect, and fourteen shadow damage, and this one is eight stamina, eight intellect, and fourteen fire damage. These rings are really, really, really good. This is a lot of stamina. Did I get disconnected? I got disconnected. I'm just going to relog here. I'll probably need to show something. So the Blood Moon Rings are absolutely crazy. Um, they are obviously only for a specific school. So for a balanced setup, I wouldn't recommend it. But if this was like, if we're running a fire damage setup, theoretically, your best in slot would be Conflagration plus the, uh, what would this be? Conflagration plus Infernal Blood Coil Band. And for the shadow damage setup, you would run, uh, actually not conflagration, you would run underworld band plus umbral blood seal because you want to maximize your shadow damage. Here's the thing though, you cannot run, as we saw there, more than one blood moon item. They are unique equipped. And trust me, infernal pact essence is the best and it is not even close. Now, something that I have considered is, would it be worth it? So we kind of need to talk about trinkets a little bit to make this conversation make sense. Would it be worth it to drop Infernal Pact Essence, take Invoker's Void Pearl, because they're very comparable, and I'll explain why in a second, and now it frees up the ability for you to drop this and take the other ring. And... I don't think so. Now, first off, this doesn't apply to, like, 99% of people. Right, like al almost nobody will be in a position where they have miniaturized combustion chamber already, and they already have, um, like in this case, underworld bands and other stuff. Right, and they're debating: Do I drop my hypercharged gear for a different blood moon ring? So we need to talk about why Infernal Pact Essence is so good. And to do that, we need to be in game because I'm going to go ahead and summon my Imp and I have Infernal Pact Essence on. Now, this is something I have explained multiple times, but Demonic Knowledge increases your spell damage and healing by a value equal to 10% of your Demon Pet's total stamina and intellect. So we can see here, whenever this pops up, I think it takes a little bit for it to update. There we go. Demonic Knowledge, uh, right now I have 62 spell damage and healing from my pet. If I take off my Infernal Pact Essence, it takes a second for the tooltip to update. It might, like, tick on the minute. So, in the meantime, basically, I'll lose a certain amount. What I can tell you until we see that is the amount is roughly equivalent to a Miniaturized Combustion Chamber and the Invoker's Void Pearl. It's like around 11 and 12, it depends. Uh, so it, it effectively is identical to these two trinkets. Now, Miniaturized Combustion Chamber is the better of the trinkets in terms of raw spell damage because it has the guaranteed 12. The on-use effect here is not actually helpful <laughs> because you have Life Tap. So you're only using it for the magic spells and effects. And the Intellect is nice, but not super important. And the fire resistance is fine, I guess. Uh, it should have updated by now. Yeah, 50. So in that case, yeah, it's 12. Now, in certain cases, I think it depends on rounding. There have been times where I've gotten 11 spell damage and healing out of this, so it was equivalent to the Void Pearl, but in this case, it gives me the exact same spell damage as uh, my Miniaturized Combustion Chamber. And it'll probably, once again, take a little bit for it to update. Right? So, on its own just evaluating this by the fact that it interacts with demonic knowledge it is really 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 good it is as good as those two spell damage trinkets this thing is fucking crazy but it's not just demonic knowledge right we also have this aoe explosion now the aoe explosion the way it works i use this a few seconds later boom and obviously i there's nothing nearby. I didn't hit anything. Thank God I didn't, because if there was a Horde player in stealth, I would have died to the Booty Bay Guards. But this thing does very minor damage on a single target, 150. 
150 is not a lot, but considering this is off the GCD, this is effectively one free, I guess, like, tick of corruption or something on a fight. It's not a lot, but it's okay. If you use this on Mechanical Menagerie, you get, like, actually a fairly decent chunk of damage because it hits, if you time it right, all four of them for 150, which is pretty good. You can also use it during Trash. It's really good in dungeons on gigantic pulls. Uh, press this, does a big explosion of damage, actually not too bad at all. So it's better on AoE, really not a lot of AoE situations, but it's free damage regardless. Now that is a, it's like a 0.1% damage increase, the on use effect. The big one here is the increased stamina and intellect for your pet. Not just the demonic knowledge, but how that impacts your damage. Now I've gone over this in detail in the Destro Guide. So if you've watched that, you already should know that giving additional mana to your imp means that it gets off more fire bolts, which is a very big chunk of your damage uh, on Destro. So that really helps. Also, the more casts it has now, the better chance you have for a Grimoire of Synergy proc. And getting a Grimoire of Synergy proc increases your damage by a ton. So really, really impactful there. And in the case of the additional stamina, well, if you're playing Demonology and you have Soul Link, the more stamina your pet has, the longer it can live without your healers keeping it up, so it effectively boosts your survivability as well. So this is just a really, really, really good trinket. Um, and that's why you'll notice that in the survivability setup, where if you have to drop one of them, you're gonna drop the uh, Thermoplug one. This is crazy. I really don't know what we replace this with, if I'm being real. There's probably some trinkets at level 60 that will force us to eventually drop this, but this is just really good. It's really, 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 really good. And the thing is, the Blood Moon items, while they are... The, while the rings are slightly better than some of the alternatives right now, they are going to be outclassed the moment we hit level 50. This thing will not be outclassed for a while. Now, it doesn't really matter because you can buy all of the Blood Moon items. You can buy the rings and you can buy this. You just can only use one of them at a specific time. But just like, you know, food for thought, right? Uh, but you should always be using Infernal Pact Essence. It's actually crazy. And as a result, you just can't use the rings. Effectively, the rings are giving you a tiny increase to survivability because of the added stamina. But realistically speaking... You'd rather just have the extra health in your pet for Demo if you're playing survival. You know, there's that. Um, and the only reason to even consider this, right? You would never, ever, ever consider running. Just to reiterate, never, ever consider running anything but these two trinkets uh, unless you already have this setup. If you have the Thermoplug trinket and you have the Void Pearl, which at this point, pretty much everybody should have the Void Pearl. Right, this obviously try to get your hands on this before setting foot in Nomergon. It's going to really help you out because if you're if you're walking into Nomergon with uh, these two trinkets, you have barely like you're barely off this. The Thermoplug trinket is good for you, right? But it's only a marginal increase over Invoker's Void Pearl. These two trinkets are very powerful. Uh, it really not that big of a change um, switching between them, but. The only time you would even want to consider taking a Blood Moon Ring is if you have the Thermoplug Trinket. Beyond uh, Before that, this is just insane. And even then, I just, I don't think it's worth it, really. It is it is definitely not worth it for Destro, right? So the Fire Ring you will never take. Because any damage increase that you would get from that three additional spell damage, or I guess technically, you would be getting... Five additional spell damage, right? Because you would be replacing the lore keepers, not the hypercharged. So five additional spell damage is not worth losing out on uh actually realistically it's more like four because you would be getting twelve from Infernal Pact Essence and only eleven from the uh the Pearl. So you're getting four additional fire spell damage. But you're losing 80 intellect on your imp, which is like a ton of firebolt casts. That is not worth it at all for fire damage. For shadow damage, it's a little bit more of a tough call. But the thing about shadow damage, right, is with shadow damage, you have underworld band as an option. And underworld band, 
it's not bad. If you really want to push your shadow damage, this is your abyss. And the Underworld Band problem is the Umbral Crystal problem, but even worse. So, you know, I I'm sure most people probably already know. I got logged down on these. Um, I'm sure most people already know the situation with, uh, with Underworld Band, right? It's a pretty iconic classic item in that it's very rare and very sought after. But if I go over to the auction house here, Underworld Band, right? 200 golds. To the auction house here. Let me first check my sniper script prices. Am I still the cheapest? Yep, I've been undercut. Underworld, 225 gold, right? Like I could bid for 165 and like I can afford it, but like, do I want to? <laughs> do I really want to spend most of the liquid gold that I have on my bank alt to get a slight increase to my shadow damage dealt? Not really. Not really at all. Uh, because once again, this is only for Menagerie right now. Now, like, there is a chance, right, that this is still our best-in-slot ring for next phase. And, well, I, there is, so Umbral Crystal, I think, I haven't looked ahead too much, but I'm fairly sure that there are better offhands that we get. Ah, uh, I convinced myself, I, I gotta check. I gotta check. Wowhead, Classic. Database, items, offhand frills, 40. By the way, if you're ever trying to figure out a lot of this stuff on your own, a lot of times this is where I live, right? Uh, faction doesn't matter. Warlock. Acquired level. Uh, interesting. So I don't know what this quest is. I, I normally haven't played Warlock, so I don't really know it a ton. So, we get a plus 16 to fire spells and effects. That's pretty good. So, that'll be an upgrade over Necronomicon next phase for the pure fire damage builds. Um, Drake Stone is... Oh, yeah. Can this... This rolls, like, of something. Yeah. But this is off... Yeah, so this is from Sunken Temple. So Drake Stone can roll a Shadow Wrath, right? Which would be significantly better. But assuming we're correct and Sunken Temple is the next raid, then you won't be able to get this, at least not in its current form. So it's kind of up in the air. Because there, there may be... Like, Drake Stone is pretty iconic. So I have a feeling that if Sunken Temple is the raid, there's going to be a Drake Stone offhand that is very good. Almost certainly, because they have reworked a lot of these, these items, like Crowd Pumbler, right? They reworked into Automatic Crowd Pumbler. Um, they reworked the uh, Thermoplug rings into, like, the Hypercharged Bands. So, we have options, right? Is there any other alternative? I'm not really seeing anything. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Uh, Spirit of Aquamentus increases damage and healing by magical spells and effects by 20. So, this is just strictly better than... And, like, what about this one? Yep, this gives up to 19 Shadow Spell Damage. And that's like a world drop. Requires level 47. Uh, what's It's dangerous to go alone. This has... Requires level 47. This is the Lincoln quest line. And... We're not going to take that. Yeah, so... Basically... Uh, Umbral Crystal... While it is technically speaking best in slot right now... It is going to be outclassed by options next phase no matter what. Even if we don't get a better Drake Stone, which we most likely will, that Lincoln Quest reward, that's going to be in the game for sure. And that's not going anywhere, and it, it's uh, it's better. But if we look at items, uh, armor, is it under armor? Yeah, under jewelry rings. Same deal, Warlock Apply Filter. And then required here. Um, so that is... Ooh, so the Black Fathom Deeps quest. That's available at level 50? Really? The Princess's Surprise. 
Yeah, it literally is exactly at level 50. So that's going to be difficult to get, but we technically speaking can do that. There's going to be that thing. People who want survivability are going to love that ring. Um, but yeah, Songstone of Ironforge, so that's plus 18. So that is definitely better than Underworld Band, for sure. And can this roll a Fiery or Shadow Wrath? It can't. Uh, that's a Resistance Ring. Dark Moon Ring, no, no. Blackstone Band, no, we wouldn't want that. Great Claw Band, can this roll? Can roll Resistances, it can't roll Spell Damage. Uh, plus nine. I don't think Random Rings can run it. That's the same ring, for, but it's the Horde version. Uh, Cyclop, you know, I looked at that one already. Legionnaire's Band. That, yeah, that's the, um... It's Lord, yeah, Lore Keeper's Ring. So the level 48 version of Lore Keepers gives you plus 12. So technically Underworld Band is still better than that. But this will be um, an upgrade over the other one. So we'd be running this plus hypercharged gear for like a balance setup. And I don't think there's any others. Yeah. Pretty sure. Pretty sure it is still the best option. Runes ring. What is this? Yeah. I don't think random affixes on rings have a chance to roll. Band of the Unicorn. That's interesting. Um, so that's actually... If we wanted purely damage, we at least pre-raid would probably in that case run... Band of the Unicorn plus the level 48 uh, Warsung Goltring over Hypercharge Gear. Um, for like a, a regular setup. Uh, but that is interesting in that I believe, yeah. So Underworld Band is still, provided we don't get anything new in Phase 3, it is still the second best ring that you can get for Shadow Damage. Even at level 50. We'll be able to get, uh, once we do the Black Feather or the Black Rock Depths quest, we'll be able to get that. And then you can either run Band of the Unicorn or the Warsong Gulch one, um, especially if you're going for fire. But for shadow damage, this is still it. So, considering I've kind of teased that it looks like, based on data mining, the shadow damage dot build might become significantly stronger next phase now if you invest in underworld band and it ends up being completely undertuned and garbage uh when the new runes come out i will not be held accountable for that i'm just letting you know you know it's important to have access to all of the information possible so underworld band in my opinion could be considered a better investment than umbral crystal because it will remain relevant for longer I'm not going to look all the way to level 60, but I believe it is still one of the best rings that you can get all the way up to level 60. Not 100% sure on that, but it may actually still be, at least pre-level 60 raids, the best shadow spell damage ring. I vaguely remember hearing that it is. And it has 10 stamina, which is really beefy. For a survivability standpoint, that is really nice. So what I can say for sure is that if I get an Underworld Band on my Warlock, which as of yet, that is one BOE that I have not been able to find for cheap. I'm pretty sure people have Auction House bots sniping those ones. Uh, if I do manage to get one of those, I am holding on to it. I don't think I will automatically equip it. I would probably keep it in my bags until P3 and then wait to see how things turn out. But there's a good chance that it would be good, so I'd at least want to hold on to it. Uh, but if you were to use an Underworld Band right now, I would not say it's a bad option. Um, also, I actually, I didn't even think about this, technically speaking. And this is, we're getting a little bit crazy here. You could actually just run two. So, I actually completely forgot it wasn't unique equipped. That is something you could do, but I, I think it is a little bit extreme. I actually do know, <laughs> there is a... Warlock on my server on Horde side, who, because I, like I said, I've been trying to sell this Umbral Crystal. He has been harassing me for days, telling me that, like, 
basically demanding that I sell him my Umbral Crystal for 30 gold. And he told me that, like, I am, like, the best Affliction Warlock on this server. I have two Underworld bands. You're not going to find anybody else who went to that investment to build Affliction. I am the only real seller that you're going to get, and I am making you a real offer of 30 gold for your Umbral Crystal. So you can either take my offer, or you can keep spamming and trade for weeks and get no buyers. And I'm like, okay, um, first off, fuck you, 30 gold for Umbral Crystal. You can see the price of the auction house. I know it sells. And also, Affliction Warlock? Uh, like, uh, hello? What about Shadow Priest? Right? Like, yeah, you may be the only Affliction Warlock on the server. You're not my market. I'm trying to sell the fucking Shadow Priests, not your dumbass. Um, but some guy, apparently on my server, I do know for a fact, has two Underworld bands because he flexed them on me to try and get me to lowball or accept his lowball offer at Umble Crystal. Weird marketing strategy, by the way. Generally speaking, when you're trying to get a bargain from somebody like insulting them and telling them like how good you are at the game and how you deserve the item is really not a good plan um i've actually lowered my prices for people and the only times i lower my price is when people are really nice like i met a hunter who was buying one of my sniper scopes and he was you know really friendly the entire time i was talking to him and then like after i sold him the scope uh he was like asking me questions about like you know what I think that he should use, like, the scope on, like, which bows he should use. Basically, just, like, he was being a human, right? So, like, I gave him, you know, I, I'm not a hunter expert, but I gave him, like, the bit of advice that I know. And, you know, he was, like, really nice, really thankful. And he was worried because he was like, well, I don't know if I, like, if I use my scope now, I might not have another one later. And at the end, I told him, like, look, man, if you get uh, the epic gun from Nomergon, send me a message. I will give you a second sniper scope for free. Because he, he's a nice guy, right? And, like, I, I I only bend over backwards for people who are just, I don't know, nice. It seems logical, right? You would, you would think that that is just what everybody assumes, right? You know, be a nice person. Don't be a dickhead. You know, people treat you better. But apparently some people, like, double underworld band guy, think that it's better to just, you know, harass people in trade chat for days on end. And somehow they will accept your uh, lowball offer. Random tangent, but... Um, the moment I started talking about double underworld ban, that guy came back to haunt my fucking thoughts. So, um, anyways, uh, yeah, you could do this. Uh, I, I definitely would not recommend the second one because as we already see at level 50, it is, um, what should we call it? At level 50, it is going to be replaced. So theoretically speaking, this is like the bis parse setup for mechanical menagerie right now. Um, miss me with that shit. I don't, I'm not going to get this, um, but I think the second one is especially overkill because hypercharged gear is very good. Uh, it is a solid upgrade over lore keepers ring, right? That's like five, five spell damage and five stamina. That's pretty good, but it's, um, yeah, it's really not worth it. And I think funny thing that we should say this because. Uh, the entire reason that I went on this super long tangent about Underworld Band is because I was going to say that, hey, if you have Underworld Band plus Umbral Blood Seal, that is technically speaking the best setup. But I mean, if we're really min-maxing, we're just buying two Underworld Bands anyways, right? So you don't even need Umbral Blood Seal. It's actually just not even a damage increase. So this is just better for a perfectly min-maxed shadow damage setup regardless and it is better for a perfectly min maxed fire setup because of the intellect that it gives your imp so all of that to say while i am going to include these rings on the list because yeah technically they're they're good you should literally never buy them or equip them it is genuinely a waste of money and time to get these rings and just have them sit in your character. Because as I think I've clearly demonstrated here, there is no situation ever in this game, not now, not at level 50, where you are going to use this ring or this ring. Um, in fact, let me just, because I am actually sharing this document in my Discord after I post this video, do not ever use the rings. They are on the list just for reference okay there we go just want to make that absolutely abundantly clear 
so nobody ever gets confused. Yeah, do not use these ever. Um, anywho. Long time to talk about that, but we're almost done, and we kind of already got the discussion of trinkets out of the way. So we already talked about damage trinkets. Uh, that has already been covered, right? If we look at uh, trinkets on here for DPS, Infernal Pact Essence, Miniaturized Combustion Chamber, Invoker's Void Pearl, it's really straightforward. That's just it. Now, that is going to be your best in slot setup no matter what. If, for whatever reason, you do not have one of these trinkets, and Infernal Pact Essence does not take a long time to get. It's five silver coins. Five silver coins is maybe two to three blood moons because you also want to buy a uh, blood rot cloak. And mind you, uh, the Stranglethorn Veil event, horrible as a warlock. It is misery as a warlock. I, if you do not want to do blood moon, I feel your pain there. I tried it. It was suffering. I suffered through it just to get my Infernal Pact Essence and my um, Blood Rock Cloak, never again. It's just bad. Uh, honestly, in the future, I am probably only going to do it with like a full guild pre-made, just to farm a Rathy Basin rep, because obviously that's like more efficient than actually doing a Rathy Basin. And I don't even know if I'm going to do that this phase, because I probably won't need a Rathy Basin rep next phase, I think maybe in like next week or so, I'll probably start doing... Actually, no, not next week. Whenever they announce phase three and we have a general idea on what to expect, then I will do my like pure speculation phase three bis list and look into, is there any merit to the Arathi Basin items being good for belt or boots in phase three? And if there is, maybe I'll go ahead and farm out the rep now um and i'll probably recommend people do the same but until then i just can't be fucking asked to do stranglethorn veil again especially because you don't even need the mount right you already get the free mount as a warlock so it's not even like you want to get 100 golds uh to save on the mount costs there's just literally no point or 100 silver you know what i mean um yeah it's just completely worthless uh as for other stuff right Rune of Perfection is an interesting one. Rune of Perfection... So, I obviously I have one here in my bags. It's not a bad trinket. It was... I used it in Phase 1, right? Obviously, because we didn't really have any better option. And because a lot of the fights in Black Fathom Deeps had Shadow Resistance. So, you were actually getting value out of Rune of Perfection. Uh, the thing about Rune of Perfection to remember is that this is not hit chance, Right? This does not increase the chance for your spells to hit the target. There is a difference between your spell's chance to hit and your spell's chance to be resisted by the enemy. Um, hit chance is determined by your level compared to the enemy's level. So, like, Nurmagan bosses have, like, you know, the 5% required to not get a resist. And then if an enemy has built-in resistances, which some of them do to a certain extent, I don't know exactly what the Nomergon boss resistances are, um, but it's not high. It's not anything like Kelris having a ridiculous amount of shadow resistance, right? Which just fucked Warlocks at the start of the phase until they lowered it. So nothing even remotely on the level of Black Fathom Deeps. But if the target has, let's say, 20 resistance, then I... I don't fucking know the formula for how the chance for your spells to be resisted would change based on that. What I do know is that if a boss has 20, you know, fire resistance and you have this on, your spells will treat the bosses if they have zero fire resistance. Uh, what One thing important to know about Rune of Perfection is that it doesn't affect anything for other players. So the wording on here is kind of bad. It sounds like it should apply an effect to the enemy that reduces their resistance but it doesn't it just like i said it makes your spells act as if the enemy d has 20 less resistance but if the enemy has zero fire resistance then this effect will do nothing you can't give an enemy negative resistance like you can't make the enemy more vulnerable to your fire damage so this would technically speaking be a damage increase if they had resistance but if they don't have resistance it is not worthless because it still has stamina as a stat stick, but it is not good. 
uh, because this also has seven stamina, right? So if there is no resistance on the target, this is just strictly worse than Wordle's Hardened Core, right? Um, we obviously don't know what the resistances are going to be in next raid. We are going to get a better version of this, right? Because this is uh, actually will we? No, I don't think we will. Come to think, but uh, scratch that. Um, because the next version of this is at level sixty. And at, wait, no, there isn't even a better version. Um. Head. Uh, yeah, I think actually that this is the best we get. Rune of Perfection. Because there is a level 60 version, I believe, that was data mines, like an original classic, and it just never got added to the game. Yeah, it's just the level 41. Okay. Yeah, so ignore what I just said. This is the best version that we're ever going to get. Uh, I really don't think we'll ever continue using Rune of Perfection. It's not a bad item, and it's like... I used it while leveling, because I, I had nothing better, but it's just not really worth it, right? It, there's just no no true value out of it at this point. Um, I have it on here just because, like, if there is a resist fight, I made this, you know, before I knew what was in No Mergon, right? Um, I'm not even going to bother talking about Thunderbrew Boot Flask. It's a quest item, right? I put Domesticated Attack Chicken on here, be and you can see I put question mark, question mark, because I have no idea if it's good or bad. Um, I don't think it's worth running. Uh, the thing about Domesticated Attack Chicken is it it's not going to do enough damage for you to run it over any of the other trinkets. Definitely not Infernal Pact Essence, right? We've already talked about how insane that is. But you could argue that maybe if your pet did a lot of damage, it would be worth running instead of, like, Combustion Chamber. But it doesn't. Now, it, Attack Chicken is nice because it can squawk. It, the way it worked, I looked into it a little bit. The Gnomish Battle Chicken that you get from Engineering is identical to the one from the Nomergod Trinket. Like, the entity it summons is literally exactly the same. But apparently, the version that we have in Sod is the version that was after the TBC nerf. I, I'm, I did not do hardcore TBC rating, so forgive me if I misunderstand some of this. But based on what I've been reading, it seems like... Prior to some change that Blizzard made, there was a way to force Battle Chicken squawks that gave your entire group an attack speed bonus. So stacking Battle Chickens and cycling them to keep up the attack speed bonus was like really broken. And then at some point in TBC Classic, they changed that. So it was now a fixed low proc chance to happen and there was no way to guarantee it. So there was no realistic way for it to actually be better than normal trinkets. And apparently that fixed version is the version that we have in Season of Discovery. So it is not overpowered and it is not worth running as a caster. Apparently it's still pretty good for melee because it does okay damage and also melee don't really have a great second trinket option. They have the, um, the what's it called? The attack speed increase thing from Thermaplug and of course Avengers Void Pearl. So they do have two solid ones, nowhere on the level of Infernal Pact Essence in terms of insanity. But technically speaking, if they manage to use the Trinket and get an attack speed proc for a melee DPS, it would be good for them. Um, but it is not worth running for us. Same deal with Mechanical Dragonling. One interesting thing about Mechanical Dragonling is a lot of engineering pets like that, and this includes the Dragonling, scale with your engineering skill. So right now, because gnomes with their racial can get um 240 engineering gnomes can summon a stronger mechanical dragonling than anybody else in the game now that actually might be some tech for other classes to consider really just warriors i guess but then like warriors also you know would rather be human or orc for the weapon skill so i don't really know if the engineering racial is that impactful for them um yeah so, like, it's interesting tech that, technically speaking, the Mithril Dragonling is stronger for gnomes than anybody else, but it's just still not worth running. It's definitely not worth it for Warlocks just because of how insane our trinkets are, right? But I'm trying to think of, like, would it be better for anybody else? But, like, you know, this is... It. we. I gotta stay somewhat on topic, right? I can't ramble too much. Um, and then, of course, I have, like, the other Rune of Perfection on there. 
Now, for DPS, you know, we've already discussed it in pretty thorough detail. It's relatively straightforward. The more interesting discussion is the effect of HP trinkets. And I... I'm changing my mind on this from when I originally wrote this. Um, actually, I genuinely don't know why I had it written like that. World's Heart, World's Heart and Core is just better than any of the other trinkets. Arena Grandmaster is on a 30-minute cooldown. That's just not a reliable trinket, right? It's So let's take a look, right, at Survival. What are we getting as options? 1% dodge. And a 30 minute, it doesn't show on here, but take my word for it, it's 30 minute. 30 minute cooldown on a solid absorb shield. Not bad, but not insane either. This is 750 to 125. Like, uh, this is less than a nature protection potion. It's really not that much. So you're getting very, very, very little value out of this trinket. If we were able to get this in phase one, it would have been really good. But we're, we weren't, so it's just really bad, honestly. Um, I, uh, I, I like. I guess technically speaking, all of the other survivability trinkets are also pretty fucking terrible. So I, I'm actually just going to do this. Um, I don't really. I wouldn't change any of the rankings here, just because like. They're all roughly comparable. Like, the Stamina on Rune of Perfection, I would say, is personally more valuable than Arena Grandmaster, and I'm actually going to go ahead and change that to reflect it. I'll put a greater than equal. I still want to distinguish that. I think if you are going to take a defensive trinket, I genuinely believe this is better than Arena Grandmaster. I just do not think this is worth farming, like, at all. It's just not good. Really, it's just not good. Um, and, and this is, like I said, effective HP, right? Because it's ignoring survivability. Where, like, I have on here effective HP, but, like, technically speaking, Infernal Pact Essence is also kind of effective HP for Demo. And any spell damage and healing trinket also gives you some form of survivability in the form of healing. And I think that's just more valuable than, like, most of this stuff provides. Defiler's Talisman, just so we can get it clear, right? Um, Defiler's Talisman, it's... Yeah, well, it's Talisman of Arathor, same deal. Uh, absorbs a pretty terrible amount of physical damage. There's a very low cooldown on this, but it's just... This is no... There's no physical damage reduction here, and this is giving you nothing else. Like, th this is just bad. Um, I'm actually just... Yeah. I'm going to take out the equals. <laughs> I'm slowly convincing myself of how terrible all of these trinkets are. And in fact, I'm going to remove that. And it's just... Yeah. It's just better. Um, man. That's rough. The only good trinket on here, mind you, is Blazing Emblem. Blazing Emblem is actually really, 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 really good. 15 fire resistance increases your fire resistance by 50. Huge amount, especially for this level, and reduces all fire damage taken by 25. That is, right now, the best survivability trinket next to Wordle's Heart and Core. But obviously, it's only for fire damage. And, like... I, obviously, fire damage can be scary, right? So, the fire damage dot on, like, Phase 1 Thermoplug... This would give you some decent DR for it. Let's also... I forget what the cooldown on this is, so I'm just going to double check. Um, 10 minute. Not terrible. Uh, it means you could probably use this on uh, Mechanical Menagerie and maybe have it up for, like, the final phase of Thermoplug because he still does final uh, fire damage on, like, the suit that has all the abilities. Um, this is obviously... If we ever have a damage... Uh, a fight that is primarily fire damage, this is nuts. I hope I don't need to say that. It's broken for any pure fire damage fight. So I already have five of these <laughs> sitting in my bank because nobody really wants them. So sometimes I see them up for like literally five gold and I just buy it and bank it. And when Molten Core rolls around, oh baby, these things are going to sell like hotcakes. Really, really, really good trinket. Just not really useful right now. And... 
I genuinely do not think it is worth using just for Menagerie, right? Like... Like, because the problem with Overheat, right, is... This will help you with one Overheat, but if your healers are unable to keep you up through Overheat... They're, like, well, first off, they're bad, but also... If they can't keep up through, like, the first overheat, then you're just going to die to, like, the second one anyways. So, this is pretty much only good if you're benefiting from the passive fire resist all the time, right? It's giving you effectively a shit ton of mitigation. And there is one very clear period of time in the fight where you can press this and get, like, insane value. And that's just really not the case at all. And the only case where I could maybe see that being true is the very end of P1 of Thermoplug. But then, like, you're just... You, you effectively have a dead trinket slot for the rest of the fight. And Warlocks have such good trinkets. So I just can't justify this. The only good survivability trinket, which is why I put it so far ahead of the others, is Wordle's Hardened Core. Because this gives you the resistances or whatever. That's really never going to actually meaningfully increase your survivability. 1% dodge is fine. It's not bad. Um, and it has flat 7 stamina. So it is just a stamina stat stick on the same level as the higher level um, Rune of Perfection. So just having it equipped gives you significantly more survivability than any of these other trinkets. And of course, the odd use effect, right? Increases armor by 1,000. Effect cannot be removed and it lasts for 10 seconds. This is, uh, of course, armor. I would say this is less useful to negate physical damage than this is for negating fire damage. So if you have a massive fire damage boss, let's say in Sunken Temple or something like that, this will be really, 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 really powerful. Whereas Wordle's Hardened Core will be like eh, on most fights. And there may come a situation where this is really good. 30 minute cooldown does make it like significantly more restrictive than like a 10 minute cooldown. So it's a little bit unfortunate there. But I could definitely see situations where this could be helpful because just armor, which effectively, you know, physical damage reduction, physical damage reduction is much more universally applicable than anything else. So if there is, like, a really hard-hitting boss in Sunken Temple where, like, it has really fast auto attacks and it's just, like, whack, 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 and it's for, like, a short period of time and you can press Wordle's Hardened Core and negate that, it'll be really good there. So, I actually have this. Um, I'm not using it at all, and frankly, I, I really don't recommend anybody use this for Nomergon. Like, it's not bad, but there's just really no situation in this raid where you actually need it. Um... And quite frankly, the only boss where it is really helpful is Menagerie for Cluck Windows. But the movement speed is actually really frustrating to deal with on Menagerie because you have to basically be constantly repositioning the bosses. Uh, it's a very movement-heavy fight, so it's a little bit of a downside there as well. And, like, on Thermoplug, it just doesn't really do much. All the scary damage on Thermoplug is elemental, so... It's just really not that helpful right now. Uh, it's just better to use the spell damage and healing trinkets and just get more Master Channeler healing if we're talking survivability. But it is good enough to at least warrant using if you really, really, really feel like it. It's not terrible. And it does have potential uses in future phases, which I think gives it some points in my mind. Okay, um, final thing to talk about, wands, uh, before we discuss the, the tier set bonuses. Mechano Strider Gear Shifter is just your best wand. Like, there's really not a lot of nuance here. It's just, which wand has the most spell damage and healing? And it's this one. And there's no better wands. One thing I will quickly note, just in case anybody gets confused, if you turn on random suffixes, you're going to see all these wands up here that have higher numbers. I don't know what is going on here. These wands don't exist. Like, their Ember Wand and Umbral Wand are, like, they are wands in the game, but they cap out at plus nine. This thing. This is the only real wand that you can get. 
There was one of these up on the Horde Auction House. I don't know if it still is. Uh, I got logged out again. Uh, there was one up on the Horde Auction House for like 60 gold or something the other day. And Umbral, Umbral Wand of the Wolf. Yeah, so it's not up anymore. So it definitely, it can drop. I would not recommend getting it because obviously plus nine for a specific school is just worse than plus nine damage and healing. Strictly worse, quite literally. So don't invest in these and these don't exist. So don't try to hunt for these. I spent like weeks trying to see if these actually existed. And then I found out that it was just some ghost in the machine and uh, 60 upgrades. I don't know why these show. I wanted to mention it just in case anybody else gets confused. And then your next best are these two. Greater Mystic Wand is like dirt cheap. You can get one of these in the auction house for literally pennies. So everybody should have this. The moment you hit level 30, buy one of these off the auction house. It's just good. And then you should try to farm Necrotic Wand before entering Nomergon. Same deal, it's off Azure the Sleepless. So every time you kill Azure the Sleepless, every time you find him up, you're either going to get your Priebus Wand or your Priebus Necklace. Now, if you're really unlucky, you can kill him like five times and you could keep getting the wand and you can never see the necklace, right? But that's one of the nice things, especially as a warlock, of doing that Scarlet Monastery farm. You're going to get at least two out of three of your Priebus items just by doing that, because you'll get Orb of the Forgotten Seer from Thalnos, and the moment you find Azure, you are guaranteed to get one of your two Priebus items. And if you keep farming him, you may get the other one, so it's just good. But obviously, Gear Shifter is better. Really not much to say about that one. It's just the best one. Okay. So, uh, with all of that out of the way, oh, one thing that, uh, real quick, kind of skipped over. I did talk about Nog's Brilliant Ring earlier. I will just say there really aren't any other good survivability rings. So, if you are going for survivability, obviously this is a good ring, right? It has a shit ton of armor and stamina. We already discussed that earlier, but there aren't really any other ones that you can combo this with. So I would say either take Hypercharged Gear or Lore Keeper's Ring is honestly pretty good. It has five stamina. Like, what more could you ask for? Hexnut is also good. It has six stamina. So any one of these good rings, uh, or any one of these rings is nice to pair up. Hell, you could even make an argument that Underworld Band is your best in slot second survivability ring because 10 stamina is quite a lot so something to consider i just realized i never talked about survivability rings but it, it's kind of a moot point because there just really isn't a lot there um just heard some weird thrumming noise i think somebody's like revving their engine outside okay so final point of discussion we have chest pants and boots now, the easy answer is that your Biss is the tier set, right? You know, pretty straightforward. However, if you're like me, you got this piece of shit. I cannot somehow win tier pants. I, I am cursed. Go watch on this channel. I have another video of, it's called 45 Seconds of Suffering. Or not, not seconds. 45 minutes of suffering. I played Destro DPS in uh, like a pug. And it was awful. And at the very end of the video, tear pants dropped. I rolled a fucking one. And then to last night, or uh, yeah, technically tonight, uh, in my guild's alt raid, which, you know, they technically, they wanted me to bring my paladin to the main raid, so I... I brought my Warlock to the alt raid. Uh, tier Pants dropped again. I rolled an 80. And then somebody rolls an 87. And... Uh, now, one thing is, I did get... Uh, I, I did get um, this out of it. Because this also dropped. And the priest who beat me on the Tear Pants roll, he won, like, basically half the loot in the raid. And, like, you know, for guild runs, we don't do... Um, we don't do like, you know, plus ones or anything. It's like, if you win it, you win it within reason though. Like, you know, a few times, if it's like, if it's somebody's alt, they'll be like, Hey, can you, you know, give that to the main, but it's like all, you know, everybody's chill about it. Uh, actually the way that this guild handles loot, I fucking love it. Everybody is super chill about loot. You know, 
I would love tear pants, but like, look, I know that it's going to somebody who needs it. So, um, but the Shadow Priest who won the rolls won like everything. So I got the second highest roll on this trinket, the the World Warper, and he rolled like a ninety and beat me again. And everybody was like, "Oh man, give it to Lenara. You already took the tear pants." And you know, he he didn't give a shit. He was like, "Yeah, joking. Like, yeah, sure, you know, Lenara." Um, I even said, "I'm like, I don't really care." And he said, "No, no, no, take it." Like. I don't really give a shit about having this. It's neat. It's a cool trinket, you know, for fun. Um, but he was like, yeah, I, don't, I apparently he has it on his main. So he's like, I don't give a shit. You take it. I already took your tear pants. Um, but yeah, I'm like, ah, eh, no, it sucks. But uh, so it kind of sucks that I unfortunately still only have two piece. Uh, I'm literally outside of worse on Gulch Racers. If I get tear pants, I'm full this. But I don't have this. So. Uh, well, I can sit here and say that this is the easy answer. Just get four piece or, or three piece, at least. It's really not that simple. Um, getting two piece is much more important than getting three piece, though. And unfortunately, the weakest slot to have your tier piece in uh, for the, the third slot is boots. Getting pants is really, really nice. The tier pants are actually quite strong. And so is the tier chest. Uh, tier chest is especially good. It, it's a trade-off because like the tier chest is really good, but there's also a lot of really good alternative chest options. The tier pants are really good. Not quite as good as the tier chest, but the pants alternatives suck massive dick. So it these two are really good. Whereas like boots, right? The tier boots are okay, and there are fantastic boots alternatives. So like this is definitely the weakest of the three tier pieces. Um, and we'll get to like some of the alternatives, right? Uh, chest piece. So we'll take a look real quick at what I have on here. Hyperconductive robe. If you if it gives you two piece or three piece, over robe of the magi, over hyperconductive robe one piece, over irradiated robe, elemental raiment, dreamweave vest, blah 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 blah. So robe of the magi is I think the big one here. Uh, if we look at ignore, by the way, I will say irradiated, never run a radiated chest, never run a radiated pants that I'm sure if I don't say that people will ask you are trolling. If you run this, it's not even good uh, for starters. If you get the two piece set bonus, you actually lose additional stamina. You can see two set minus five stamina. So the only justification for running an irradiated piece is if you have a single irradiated piece, you don't trigger the two sets. You are not losing quite as much stamina, so it is not quite as bad. But, like, look at this. This gives me 16 spell damage, and the tier, the regular tier set gives me 13. You're getting three extra spell damage, but you're losing a shit ton of stamina. That's a lot of survivability right there. And, like, you, know, you get MP5, whoop de doo right? And the set bonuses really aren't even that good. Like, plus 11 magic and healing. We'll talk about the three piece here because it's kind of interesting. Um, but 1% crit does not outweigh 1% hit. Like, they're roughly equal. And this loses you survivability. This gives you survivability in the form of 100 armor. And the hyperconductive three piece, as of current tuning, is better than the irradiated three piece. So, the only reason to run. An irradiated piece is because the stats on it are so much better than what you have and it is the only irradiated piece you have you are not running a two piece and the only slot where that will be justified is boots so i guess we could talk about boots now irradiated boots are actually insane uh they still lose you stamina so that sucks but they have quite a lot of spell power not quite as much as like the of shadow wrath stuff but you know we're not really considering this this is never something that you're going to run um really the the item to coming from phase one that you want to consider is extra planar this is your pre-raid bis and because as i've already said the tailoring helm is really broken and you should be getting this you should just also get the extra planar spider silk now if you were playing phase one you probably already have this if you did not play phase one and you're working on your warlock. I know it can be a little bit of a tall ask to say, go do the BFD quest line just to get this item. But I'm telling you, these boots are fucking ridiculous. The only reason we aren't still running these is because it prevents us from getting our three piece bonus. This is really good. Plus seven spell damage and healing is really not that worse than plus 11. 
This still has 1% hit flat on it, which is really strong. The only other piece is irradiated that has this. In terms of raw stats, this is really not that much worse than irradiated. And you can see here by like the equivalency point thing, you know, don't treat it as gospel, but it says something when this level 25 item is still considered to be the second best piece by this, you know, scoring system. And that's not even taking into consideration. That's not even taking into consideration the 10 minute cooldown on use effect to get 30% damage reduction for six seconds. You want to talk like defensive cooldowns for thermoplug, menagerie, overheat? This thing kicks fucking ass. Overheat's coming out, you're low health, your healers aren't prepared. 30% DR, it's literally just a bonus soul link. Soul link is 30% DR. This is just the same thing on top of that. It's really, 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 really fucking good. I really wish that the tier slot was anything other than boots because we would probably still want to run this. It's that powerful. Um, and it's definitely our pre-raid bis and it's not even close, which is kind of why, like, I don't even really want to talk about the other boots, like South Sea Mojo boots. Who, who the fuck cares, right? Who the fuck cares about any of this stuff? And like the Highlanders cloth boots, it's kind of why I said before, like, you could honestly make an argument that extra planar spider silk is a better survivability boots than the Highlanders cloth boots. Sure, you're getting half the stamina. Sure, you're getting less armor. But in the moments where it counts, having 30% DR for six seconds is going to keep you alive much more often than a slight bit of additional stamina and armor. So, like, fuck these boots. Um, acidic waiters, they're, they're like, okay, but this has no stamina. This has only spell damage and healing, and this has hit, right? So realistically speaking, your boots options come down to three things. This for the three-piece, this for the higher spell damage and healing and 1% hit, or this because it's just Giga Chad boots that unfortunately don't really interact with anything else. And I would say really, if you don't have your tier boots, hyperconductive walkers, really go with either one of these and bring these pre-raid you can justify using irradiated boots i feel uh if you do not have hyperconductive walkers and uh if you do have hyperconductive walkers and you do not have another tier piece irradiated boots are better in a vacuum but the moment that you can turn on the two-piece bonus this loses a lot of value because now it's not actually providing you with one percent hit because you're getting 1% hit from the set bonus just the same. So this is effectively the same. And then you're also getting added survivability from this. So irradiated boots is only good if you have chest pants or um, whatchamacallit, or you have nothing uh, to enable your two piece at all. Uh, it's a little bit weird in that way. Uh, I, I've written out the bonuses to kind of reflect that on like you know this is when this stuff is good i have like the two piece three piece i'm not going to go ahead and break all that down because i kind of explained it just there um but i i hope you can understand what i'm saying with that but like acidic waiters you should never use this right like it's just it's just worse than extra planar spider silk you get like a tiny bit of healing for what just no get these things they're nuts and then only replace them when you either have uh, two-piece, three-piece, or irradiated boots, and no two-piece. Uh, so the boots are honestly the most straightforward part. For the pants, if you have hyperconductive skirt, you are running hyperconductive. Oh, you are running hyperconductive skirt no matter what. Uh, the shadow damage or shadow weave pants for pure shadow damage are slightly better. Right, it has twenty-one shadow damage. Um, but that's only in a vacuum, right? The moment you can enable your set bonus here, it's better. And I would say, realistically speaking, don't invest money in this. Because if I recall, can check the prices. I believe these are actually really expensive to make. Shadow weave um, pants. That's eh, not too bad. Five gold. But five gold for an item that is basically only good on one fight in the raid. And is not even remotely going to be a full-time bis item. Just it's not worth it. Uh, same with these pants, irradiated trousers just do not give enough value to justify, and that's why you can see I'm running red mage weave pants, 
So red mage weave pants, uh, you'll notice if we turn on random suffixes, there's no other ones. There is no fire suffixes. There's no shadow suffix. So go here to this. Um, actually, take it that back. There is no shadow ones. There is fire ones. Um, for shadow damage, red mage weave pants is, I would say, your best option uh, because you want a more balanced setup for menagerie. So I could run shadow weave pants and get marginally more damage, um, but then I lose out on all of the healing. It's a little bit of a trade-off for fire damage because, as we've said before, it doesn't really matter if you do not have hyperconductive steward. Keep in mind, this is still your best for all these sets because you want your set bonus, right? If you do not have any of this stuff, I have been running this. Dark Mist Pants of Fiery Wrath, the plus 27 fire damage pants. Because, right, I only have this shit. And this is a significant increase in spell damage to where I don't really care about losing the magic spells and effects. Uh, but this is only a last resort if you can't get your hands on the tier pants. Really? Okay. Thanks, game. Um, and, like, I only invested in that, like I said, like, last week or something, when it was very clear that I was cursed on tier pants, and I was not going to be able to get them anytime soon. I invested in the 27 ones, and I would not recommend buying anything below the plus 27. If you can't find these plus 27 ones... It's just not worth it, because what you'll notice is there's plus 26, right? Like, that's still technically an upgrade, but then it drops down to, like, plus 24 and plus 23. I I don't know. If you're not going to get the premium pants, the absolute bis ones, I would say just stick with Red Mage Weave, because it's really cheap. And it still gives you healing, so it's, like, fine. But I, I guess the healing doesn't really matter if you're... Eh. Do what you want to do, I guess, for that. It, th we're all talking, like, alter like basically non-bis, pre-bis alternatives, right? So it, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, really, at this point, it just depends on how much you're willing to spend uh, before you actually manage to get your hands on a, your bis. It's kind of all irrelevant because you want this. This is your endgame pants anyways. Um, and for chest, this is a really good chest piece. It's nuts. Now, I will say, a radiated robe, this is really good, right? It is not as good as a radiated boots. So, like, I, I mean, there is maybe an argument to be made for ex extra planar spider silk for the 1% hit, a radiated robe for the 1% crit, and then you just run... Like, I don't know, for pants, like, plus 27 fire damage. In a pure fire damage setup, maybe that's good, because obviously crit is realistically just valuable for fire damage. It doesn't really affect the dots right now. I have not actually seen a radiated robe drop, so I haven't really had the chance to experiment with that. Once again, you do need to consider you can only run this. Really, you can only run this as a tank if you are not taking the two-piece, right? Like, full disclosure, there is, like, a part of me that is strongly considering, at the very end of the tier, running two-piece irradiated chest and boots just to see if it, like, if it blasts, right? Because then you're getting 1% more on the fire damage fights, only because I know for a fact my survivability is not a concern at this point. The rest of my gear is already fucking bonkers. Never, ever, ever do that unless your gear is really comfortable and you have, like, all consumables and stuff. And I would probably only do that if I also had, like, the Warsong Gulch Bracers. I hopefully will get that, like, right at the end of the phase. Um, we'll see. I don't know how many more weeks we have. But realistically, you just don't want to do this, right? Um, and like cinder cloth robe, this is another option. Never run this. Uh, the problem with cinder cloth robe is it's just not good enough over the other options, namely robe of the magi, or of course, hyperconductive gold wrap. And it costs a lot of money. Um, to give you an idea, cinder cloth robe, there's not even any on the auction house, uh, which makes sense because the demand for it is extremely low. Uh, it requires heart of fire. 
So I guess I could check the Heart of Fire price. I'm sure there'll be some of those. Never mind, there aren't any. Heart of Fire. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there's one on the Alliance auction house on my server for 15 gold. That's the price I've been seeing them consistently. Uh, and it requires two of them. So the effective cost of Cindercloth Robe is 30 gold for something that is marginally better than for purely fire damage than the really good one, Robe of the Magi. This is pretty much your go-to previous item. This is worth anywhere from 20 to 40 gold. I've sold multiple at 40 gold, but I also see it go for 20 a lot. These days, especially, it goes for 20. Pretty consistently in my server, which is a decent amount. It's like, you know, twice the cost of Dreamweave gloves. This is another one of those where I would say it can be worth the investment, but also Elemental Rainment is a really good alternative. Same with Dreamweave Vest. All three of these, not Robe of Power. Robe of Power, I think, is a little bit too far behind in spell damage and healing. These are the two big ones. Robe of the Magi or Elemental Rainment are the best. Uh, Robe of the Magi being better, of course, because it has more spell damage and it also has intellect, which we value more than the resistances. And then Dreamweave is okay. A little bit less spell damage and healing, but slightly more intellect, which is not terrible, and it has the most armor. So for previous options, all three of these robes are really, really, really good. I re recommend this one, but what you'll notice a lot of times is that like Dreamweave Vest sells for very cheap. So if I look at Dreamweave, uh, actually a little bit more expensive right now than I've seen it. Depends on the time of day. Yeah, it's actually consistent price across both factions. All right, yeah, I mean, if it's this expensive, definitely not, because if I look at Elemental Rainment, seven gold, right? So, and just to show Robe of the Magi. Oh my God, I can't spell. Robe of the Magi. Yeah, 20 gold, literally cheeky little bit on that. Actually, I might get that. It's medium, so it should expire relatively soon. And I doubt many other people are going to throw a bit on this at um super early in the morning. I gotta check. Are there any similar? There's none. Actually, none up here. Uh, throw a cheeky little bit on that one, too. Uh, but yeah, so Robe of the Magi, roughly 20 golds. Um, robe, uh, or Dreamweave Vests, is roughly 15 gold on my server. Elemental Raiment, 7 gold. Now, prices will vary. I've also sold Elemental Raiments for around 20 to 25 gold, so it, it can be higher. But in my experience, this tends to be the cheapest of the three, but it is still a very good item. So if you are really trying to save your gold, you don't want to spend a lot, but you still want to get a really good previous chest, I would actually recommend this one because it is really not that far off. All you really care about is that spell damage and healing. The loss of the intellect feels a little bit bad, but it, it doesn't actually matter. And the resistances, they don't really matter much, but it's like, it's okay. You get all the good ones, fire, nature, frost. That's like what you need for Nomergon. Plus five for each isn't really going to do much on its own, but it's like every bit counts, right? Especially if you're running like, you know, Fell Hunter on... Um, Thermoplug, you know, this gives you that little bit of additional push. So, all good options. Um, that being said, I still think, of course, all of that aside, that Hyperconductive Robe with the three-piece is your best. But if you look at the way I've done chest, right, Hyperconductive Robe, if it gives you two or three-piece is your best, but then it is Robe of the Magi, then one piece, which is roughly equal to a Radiated Robe, um, one piece, I want to make that clear which is slightly better than Raiment and Dreamweave Vest. And then do not take Cinder Cloth Robe because it's really expensive. And all the other stuff down here is like really, really, really pricey or harder to get. The only exception would be Robes of the Lich. So this is from Aminar the Coldbringer. If you do not want to spend any gold whatsoever and you are really trying to save your money, like all of your gold, you are dirt poor, you know, no, no shame, right? Like I get it. A lot of people aren't really big into like farming or auction house flipping. Then this is the one to farm. It's actually a pretty solid option too, because it has a really, really, really chunky amount of stamina on there. So this is, it's not going to give you more survivability than hyperconductive, right? Because it's only double the stamina, but it has less armor. And it of course, isn't getting you towards that set bonus, right? But 
this is definitely a solid option. I just think that the other ones are going to be better. But honestly, I would say this is this is a really good one to consider if you don't want to spend any gold. Um, so I guess we've talked a lot about all those three in, in summary, right? So really key takeaways from the chest pants boot situation. Never run more than one piece irradiated. Try to get two-piece hyperconductive as soon as possible. Three-piece is good, and I'll talk a little bit more about three-piece in a second, but it's um, not as strong as the 1% hit and 100 armor from the two-piece, so getting that two-piece online as soon as you can is your biggest priority. Uh, that is a very, very big power spike. The best two pieces to get your two-piece with are chest and pants, if possible. The boots are your worst tier slot, but... Of course, if you need to take the boots to get your tier slot enabled, like the position that I am in, I have tier chest and boots, I am still using that for the two-piece. I have irradiated boots, I've actually looted it, nobody else needed it, so I just took it, and I am still not using them um, just because I value that two-piece. Uh, it, it is better, even if you have it. Though, technically speaking, until you get your three-piece, your best setup would be hyperconductive robe, hyperconductive skirt, and then either irradiated boots or extra planar spider silk. But realistically, the um, the three-piece is good. Though I would say the three-piece is only now better. Uh, up until the change recently, for like some of the early BIS lists that I put together in this phase, I actually would have said that the three-piece for hyperconductive was bad, and not worth running over the boots. Because it is worth noting that, yes, this in this particular case, these two boots are both leaps and bounds better than uh, hyperconductive walkers, right? You know, if, if we're using the equivalency point, 1622, and in the case of this, even the absolute bis for fire is only plus 11, and even here, irradiated is only plus 17, right? Um, and we already know the thing with irradiated, right? So, the... Non-tier boots are significantly better than the tier boots. And when the value of this was super low, early on the proc chance of this was basically nothing, and it was because your rune abilities could not actually proc the tier set bonus. So uh, honestly, a lot of your abilities couldn't proc it. I think they also buff the proc, the proc rate. I don't know exactly what the chance is. But it is significantly higher now. It's You have like relatively high uptime. But the most important part of this, and I, I can't actually demonstrate this in-game because, well, unfortunately, I still don't have my fucking three-piece. Uh, this may get changed eventually. If this gets changed eventually, three-piece will lose a little bit of value. It'll probably still be best, but it won't be quite as good. And a radiated will be a solid alternative. But it procs off of spell casts. And one of the spells that you can cast to proc it is Grimoire. So what you can do is right before a pull, like you're about to pull a boss, you're spamming Grimoire. And this only costs nine mana, which is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. And you can keep doing this, keep reapplying this buff and fishing for a hyperconductive proc. And then you get the proc. The proc, as we can see here, gives you 40 spell damage and healing for 10 seconds. So what you do, right? You fish for this proc. The moment you get it, you use your helmet, use your belt. And now in an ideal world, your belt gives you 3% crit. Now you have plus 40 guaranteed from the set bonus, plus 50 from the helmet, 3% crit from the belt, PI, in an, hopefully, from your priest, and you immediately rip the pull. Now suddenly you are cranking damage. You have all these modifiers allowing you to just output these godlike searing pains that are just going to make the world tremble. So the biggest advantage right now, because that is a thing of uh, you know the three piece, is that you can fish for that proc and line it up with all of your other stuff. And that is very, 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 very strong. In a vacuum, if we're outside of the context of fishing for procs, it's still good. 
I think that with the higher proc chance, it's still good enough to justify using over the irradiated boots, but it is much closer, right? Because if you don't get a proc on pull, you're kind of just like, whatever about it. It's not nearly as good. You're not stacking all the multipliers quite as much. So not, not amazing, but still good and still worth running and still without a doubt, the best option for survivability minus maybe extra planar spider silk, but I, don't, I just, I love extra planar spider silk. It's such a good item. I really wish that we could run it with everything else. It's a shame. Uh, I think that's everything. Man, three hours, three and a half hours, almost. Whew. All right. Well, uh, it was definitely a very thorough coverage of Warlock Tank Biss. And hopefully you can understand why condensing all of this information into a highly edited video would be extremely difficult because there is a lot of nuance here. Now, I went on a lot of random tangents, like, you know, double underworld band guy, or I forget what else, what other tangents. I, I went on a lot of random tangents. You know, that's just how these videos go. Um, so that, that like extended the runtime a little bit, but... There is so much here that I would have to explain that there is absolutely no chance that any version of this video would be anything under one hour. I think the most ideal situation is that I managed to trim this video down to like an hour and a half of really detailed, really concise, no repetition editing. And the way I see it, the people who would watch that video are probably still going to watch this video and enjoy it just as much. And I hope that's true. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. Um, let me know. And we'll, uh, we'll see what I can do about phase three. Uh, like I said, the, the like fun speculation, this list, kind of like, you know, what I just did on Wowhead in the middle where I'm like looking at like, you know, future items to see how good Underworld Band's going to be. That's effectively stuff like that is what you can expect to see for the P3 speculation list. We'll just look at all the different slots, like see roughly what we can expect. I'm not going to do that until we know the general details of phase three. Like, is Sunken Temple actually going to be the raid? Because if so, well, now we know that Drake Stone is off the table. Um, are they going to add new dungeons or update the loot of other dungeons because they did that for phase two if so well suddenly we might have more options to work with they added a lot of spell power gear to scarlet monastery they could do that again to black rock depths i don't know we'll see um but yeah that video will be on this channel just because it's going to be like that a lot more free form a lot more like fun you know searching stuff in wowhead on the fly uh and I don't want to put like a speculation video on my main channel, which is like aimed at my viewers who are looking for like really concrete guides, because that's mostly what I like to do. Really tightly edited, really well put together guides. I, I love ranting about shit. I like I have all like all this knowledge stuck up here. Right. And I, I like to share it with people because I know most of you enjoy hearing that as well. And it's fun to talk about it. It's fun to, you know, go on long tangents explaining like something cool that I learned the other day. Right. So. I like this format, and I know a lot of people like it too, but that's just not the type of thing that I really want to put on my main channel, so this is the perfect setting for that type of thing, and I will probably continue to use it going forward, but we'll see We'll see what the Phase 3 Best in Slot list ends up being like. Honestly, if this is really well-received, I might just do this again for Phase 3, um, but I, that is kind of to be determined, so I still don't know what the uh, reception to that's going to be. Anyways, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. And yeah, if I missed anything, let me know in the comments so that I can answer it. But I'll stop there. Peace.